So, welcome to Rule of Thirds, an offshoot of our Screen Refresh podcast. Our goal every episode is to take a little break from watching and analyzing movies to dive headfirst into some nostalgia or just get a little creative. So every month, we select a different topic and create a top three list that may or may not be near and dear to each of our hearts. Shoot us a message on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Screen Refresh, or shoot us an email to screenrefresh at gmail.com to let us know what your top three are or to suggest future topics. I'm your host, Tim, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Dean and Nick. Hello there. Greetings, evildoers. Today we're joined by Josh from the Into Video Game podcast, which unlocks our Have Every Host from Into the Video Game on a Screen Refresh podcast achievement. (laughs) Congrats, boys. I'm happy to be the catalyst. (laughs) So Josh is here today to help us get spooky. Finally, we get to discuss my favorite genre, horror, on our top personal favorite horror games. So Josh, why horror games? uh, Why did we bring you on for this one specifically? So... I mean, obviously, if you if you listen to into the video game at all, I'm the one who talks about the horror games. Sam and Cam uh, vary between themselves of between like non interest to actually like not able to play them. I remember we had an experience once when Resi Seven dropped, and I uh, I put Sam in the VR headset on it, <laughs> and he made it about ten minutes. It like literally, it was so funny. I was like, dude, you haven't even gotten anything scary yet, and he's like, the atmosphere is too much. I'm uncomfortable. I'm done. So. <laughs> That's generally more my bag amongst the guys. That's kind of where where I have my unique strength for the podcast. And that kind of comes from just growing up with horror as like a very constant thing. My mom's been super into them as long as I can remember as far as horror movies mm-hmm. go. So then growing up around watching horror movies with my mom at a much too young age and then getting into games as my own hobby, that kind of just translated over me and my brother. I've played a lot, a lot of horror games. It's something that, I don't know if it's just like a a trial every kid has to go through of finding horror movies, and then either you grow to like them, or it just is not your bag. There's never really a, a ton of middle ground, I feel. Um, yeah. So, growing up very big on horror, mainly because my brother subjected me to it until I had a Pavlovian response to it. Um, I just imagine your brother <laughs> hooking you up to a chair, like... Um, Clockwork, clockwork orange. orange yeah like clockwork orange <laughs> like, style you're gonna with watch eye it you're gonna watch it <laughs> you better watch One of my earliest memories back when i was able to start forming them i remember my parents had to like run next door for something so my brother was watching me he's three years older and he turned on something and he was just flicking channels and we landed on something and it was like it wasn't it but it was like some sort of clown and it wasn't um like a, a monster clown it was just like a guy in clown makeup and he had caught a yeah. guy and he was like slitting his throat. My brother was watching it. I was like, please turn it off. I don't like this. Yeah. He's watching. He's like, no, Too we're going to finish watching this right now. Watch it with me. <laughs> and I don't know what it was the to day this you day. become a man. <laughs> so I don't know if that's what broke me, but now I'm a fan. Mm-hmm. So I'm pretty excited to get you guys on here to talk some horror games. They've, uh, I'm very excited to to be around people that can talk about them. It's nice, like having people that I can actually talk about this stuff. With. I feel it's like hidden, it's a hidden talent of mine. Because when Tim was like, "Let's do a horror game," one, I'm like, "Man, I don't, I don't know." And then I'm looking at like my catalog, like a lot of them are horror movies and games. Like, holy shit! Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm here. <laughs> Yeah, Dean, what's your experience with horror other than watching <laughs> Mystery Science I just meant it's, 3000 it's, with me? It's good for Josh that uh, Tim and Nick are here because uh, I'm sure they'll have much more relevant games to discuss. You're a control this group. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, man, I actually like there's a lot of there's a lot to be said for like the weird places you can find horror in like not scary media. Or, like, not traditionally scary media, where, like, some people just have shit that freaks them out, and they're like, this is horror to me, and it, you're like, this is so nothing for me, and it's always interesting, I love hearing that shit. Like, that very subjective, like, this scares me type thing, that's always yeah. fun. It's like watching, oh, the movie Abyss, well, there's really nothing scary in it, but I don't like deep water. Or watching a rom-com, yeah, it's like, exactly. I'm afraid of commitment. So it's all those <laughs> types of things. Also, I feel like more recently, especially now, I don't know if it's just because of COVID and everything being more digital, of having all of the the Steam game festivals and the electronic indie fests that I'm now paying more attention to. But I've been noticing more and more indie horror coming up in terms of games, which has been yeah. very cool. Uh, so it's something we'll, we'll get into a, a little bit here. Or we might talk more offline as far as just some cool ones out there that I'd be... I'm waiting for out of the the demos and betas there. 
Yeah, exactly. I uh, I have some stuff that I can throw around. I don't know if you guys, and we'll get into it a bit more after, but I don't know if you guys have looked into Haunted PS1 at all or anything like that. But no. that kind of caters to a really neat horror subgenre that, again, but once we get into it, I, I can bring it back up. But it's it's really cool stuff. I'm, I'm a really big fan of where that's kind of going as far as modern stuff goes. Yeah. So speaking of getting into it, do we want to kick this thing off? Who wants the, I'm ready. the top of the order honors? Cue the intro music. Ah, that would have been hours ago. <laughs> or <laughs> five the minutes other, ago. <laughs> the other music you now have to find and insert there. don't want me to kick this thing off it's not gonna be on the right foot josh you want the honors <laughs> um yeah i can take top so this was this was a really hard list to compile man this was <laughs> tough there were so many games i had to comb through to make a top three and it's funny because my my tops kind of share some some similarities with my like my uh quote-unquote objective list like my my votes for best of all time uh, two of them actually fall in there. So I guess I'll start with subjective. My number one, or let's go three to one. I think three to one is better. So my third highest is a really weird one that I never talk about, but I have very personal attachments to it, is an old game called Hunter the Reckoning. Oh. There is evil everywhere. Unknown to most humans, the world is ruled and directed by supernatural forces beyond their comprehension. Vampires and werewolves see humans as pawns in an endless battle for control. All of this is hidden from humanity. But now a mysterious force has imbued a chosen few humans with not just the knowledge of the evil, but with the power to do something about it. These imbued have become hunters. Hunter, the reckoning. The reckoning is coming March 15th, 2002. So this was a PS2, Xbox, like original Xbox, and I think GameCube. Yeah, I had it on GameCube too. It was a... Uh, an uh, isometric action RPG. So like a kind of like, not top down, but like that kind of like old Fallout style camera angle. Uh, four player action game. You had different characters at all different skills. And they were just like really cheesy over the top. There was like a biker with a like shotgun a big and, axe. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. Biker with an axe and a shotgun. Every character had a gun and a melee weapon. But the dude that I'd play as was Father, I believe his name was Father Esteban Cortez. And he was just this really fucking cool <laughs> priest with a big sword that was also a cross. And his, like, gun was a crossbow. Father Esteban Cortez, Creed Judge. Judges ensure that justice is served. And it wasn't really scary. It was more of an action game, and it ended up being the kind of thing where it just freaked me out because I played it when I was really young. This is what I kind of mean by, like, the subjective horror. We're like, yeah, it was like, it had zombies in it and stuff, but it was like, you go back and watch it now, and you're like, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on. But when I was a kid, it scared the absolute shit out of me, man. Like, I would play with my brother, and I remember the, the first level is, because the whole idea is that it's it's a very simple, like, you know, hell's take, there's this ritual, hell's moving into the real world, now there's all monsters, go kill them. And I remember the first level is a subway, and there's a subway crash, and all the people start coming out as zombies. And, like, the zombies were really low poly and, like, not <laughs> textured, really, and they looked really bad. But I just remember, like, the dread that I felt watching those zombies crawling out of the subway. And I was like, man, this is so freaky. It just scared the hell out of me. And that was, like, one of the early games that I played that was really like, oh, this game is scaring me, but I'm having a good time with it. 
like I'm freaked out, but I'm having fun despite yeah. that, you know? Now, did you play, what was it, so, uh, Hunter the Reckoning Redeemer, I think was the sequel? So I think, I'm trying to remember if Redeemer is the one, I'd know it based on the cover art is the thing. Yeah. I don't think I played Redeemer. I think I played the first one. I think I just played the Reckoning. I don't think I played Redeemer. Yeah, because I remember, I think the, I think it was Redeemer that added the new character, the extra character, and I want to say it was like a woman with dual pistols or something like that. Um, so I do remember, I remember the woman with the katana and the revolver, and there was the girl with the two SMGs. So if there was a third girl character, oh, then maybe there, there was were only two in the version I played. added character, and I'm thinking of the girl with the SMGs um, from the original game. Because we, at yeah. the time, like, it was the same case as you. Like, my brother and I loved the game. It was something actually my dad got into, too, because it was like, yep. he played PC games at the time. He was getting more into console and it was something that it's easy enough to just pick up, even if you're not necessarily familiar with the console controls of, okay, so I kind of like yeah. swap around, shoot with this, melee with that. And it was, we had played like Dark Alliance. We were big into like all of the like Gauntlet Legends, all of those types of like the, as he said, the, the top down or kind of like the angled top down isometric. So this was a perfect fit of we're horror kids. We love horror and we love this type of game. So I think that's definitely. That's one that everybody should be checking out. I remember having a blast with that. Your brother let yeah. me borrow it. That's actually, I'm really glad that you guys have played it. That's like, because <laughs> I wasn't sure if it would be like, I never, there's some games, man, where like just the, the town that I grew up in, we didn't have too many people who like really got into games besides like the normal COD stuff. So there were some games that I didn't realize until like college weren't as obscure as I thought they were. So stuff like, you know, like Shadow of the Colossus, meeting someone in college that had played Shadow of the Colossus was like a revelation for me. So, yeah. like, there's always these games that are, like, anything lower than, like, the most obvious, like, surface-level game. I didn't know many people growing up who played them, so it's always interesting to me and always fun when I actually meet someone who has played, like, weird, dumb games that I played as a kid, you know? Yeah, which I know was one of the, kind of, the driving forces of, uh, at least on my part, of wanting to do this, like, the whole podcast thing and whatnot, is... There's so many things that you grew up with or you liked or you enjoyed that we've talked time and time again of, yeah, there was nobody around in school when I was like in elementary school or middle school that liked these things. And it just feels like you're screaming into the void of there's nobody to mention any of this stuff to. Yeah. So it, it's great to be able to kind of get that out there. And hopefully somebody else is out there sitting there who grew up playing like Hunter the Reckoning, who's like fist pumping right now <laughs> that somebody else is remembering yeah. it. Hunter the Reckoning. <laughs> And that was the funny thing is I was like, I was thinking because my my top two were actually pretty easy. Number two and number one were pretty easy. But then three, I was like, God, like, what do I like as much as those? And then I was thinking about just games that I had good memories of. And there's like, there's a reason Hunter the Reckoning is not my third objective best. <laughs> but I liked it a lot and I have a lot of good memories with it. So like as far as horror games go, that definitely like lies up there just for like very sentimental reasons, despite the actual horror of the game. Nostalgia you know? is a hell of a drug. Hell yeah, it is, man. <laughs> also, I realized it was... Hunter the Reckoning, um, Redeemer, and Hunter the Reckoning Wayward. I'm thinking of Wayward, where it adds the fifth character, and it's like that guy with the pickaxe. Yes, okay, yeah, so I was playing Redeemer, I think. Because the Redeemer was the one that had the priest on the box art. I remember that very distinctly, so. So, if anybody wants to go... Next for number three is otherwise I can follow that up. Dean, you want me to go before first or you better go. You want me to go? Dean's still ready. Let's keep, the, let's keep the horror fans interested. <laughs> What's it going to be from Dean? I don't know. Let's find out. So my choice is something that's actually pretty new and it's called phasmophobia. This is the only game to date that scared the shit out of me. And I'm yep. pretty jaded when it comes to games like horror. I, I laugh at it like none of this shit scares me. I mean, mm -hmm. we'll talk about it later without a doubt, but like I grew up playing <clears throat> playing Resident Evil on PlayStation when it came out and like it's not mm -hmm. scary to me and all of these like monster type stuff like I was afraid of gremlins as a kid and that was the last time I felt fear until <laughs> I played Phasmophobia. It's like a Batman origin story. <laughs> yeah, I like that as like a like a general sense you were not afraid of anything after <laughs> yeah. gremlins. Nothing as a young came child, close. gremlins came broke close. my brain. Yeah. <laughs> Gremlins erase the concept of fear. Dude, what are these things? Gremlins. I fear nothing. 
nothing. Aliens did come pretty close, but mm -hmm. um, Gremlins was a lot longer. I, I had, I was still afraid of Gremlins by the time I saw Aliens. So like, that one wins by a couple of years. But Phasmophobia freaks me the fuck out. Even now, yeah. I've seen countless YouTube streams of this game. And I have a very meta sense of like what needs to be done. I look at it like a video game. I know what I'm doing. I don't have to worry. The second I'm in that pilot seat and I'm like, all right, I have to go in the house and I have to start doing shit. Like the second you walk through the the whole game is if, if you've never played it, you're a ghost hunter. You have to figure out why or what is possessing the house that you're exploring and investigating. And that's it. You have to just experience all the weird ghostly shit that happens. You have to use like EMF readers. You have to put down salt to see if a ghost walks on it. You know, um, will the ghost write in a book if I put a book down in a room? And uh, it uses a mic. So you actually, you are the ghost hunter. You're not like playing. It's like, like an RPG where like I'm playing as someone else that's a ghost hunter that has all these abilities. Like, no, you are the one that has to walk into the room and say, you know, like, is anyone here? How old are you? Have you killed anybody? You know, like that, I've never experienced in a game before prior to this. Not even close. So when you're the one having yeah. to go into those rooms and like say that stuff, like I get fucking nervous. And I'll admit, I was I was the guy in the van for the you're first time. You're a man like, in the van. I I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't bring myself to it. I I don't want to bring go into like spirituality and shit, but like I believe in that type of shit, man. Like, I don't believe yep. to be in this. I rather, I don't believe I will not be in the same room <laughs> as a Ouija board. <laughs> Real life. Like, if there is a Ouija board present in the same room with me, I will leave it. What we're going to be doing is actually, it's going to be a Ouija board. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. Hell no. I have a strong, like, get that fucking shit away from me. I don't like meddling with that kind of stuff. So the fact that they turned it into a video game and made it as real as possible, like hands down, <laughs> most horrifying game I've ever played. Do you, yeah. uh, are you Oculus with it or are you just mouse and keyboard? Oculus was fun, but VR is just, it's a tough egg to crack only because you have to not get sick while playing it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. this is one of those you can easily get sick because you're going to be walking around a lot. And since you are standing still, but your character is moving, it throws off your sense of balance and um, it messes with your equilibrium and shit. And just it's a it's a typical thing that a lot of VR games do. This is one of those that happens to do it with. It's actually easier if you do yeah. VR because one of the quirks in the game, you can only have two. You can only have three items in your inventory at a time with VR. You can actually have four. So it's kind of cheating because you can use two hands at the same time because yeah. it's VR. Mm. But yes, in, you can carry something extra. Yeah. Um, whereas in the normal like mouse and keyboard version, you can't do that. So there are advantages to it, but it's still just as freaky. <laughs> if not maybe more. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't played this yet with these guys. I have it downloaded and queued up, but I think that we moved on to other games before I could get into it. But No, let's stop the recording now then. <laughs> <laughs> no. Live Phasmophobia. Do you have like... Nick, is it? I'm easily scared. I'll just say this off the top. I am very easily scared when it comes to games. Yeah. Less so at horror movies, but still kind of scared. <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. this it looks kind of terrifying. But would it, I feel like it might be less terrifying if I was in a group of people like this is like you're playing with other yes. people like it, live. It does help a lot. Yeah, it is. It does help a lot. I will say, like solo faz is some scary shit, man. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> solo faz is scary shit. Yeah, like. And it does. It softens it a lot when you have a group, when you have people to talk to, when you have the van guy. Cam was our van guy. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, no, it's that's an it's an excellent game, man. I'm I'm so there's so much stuff that happens in horror now that's like just it's really nice to see that the medium is still moving forward in really cool ways. Like there was horror as as a whole thing, which is nice because you guys are like you do general pop culture stuff. So I can talk more about movies with you guys, too, which I can't do with the guys on, on into the video game. <laughs> I, I feel like horror as a medium, even in movies for a while, hit a real lull where it was like there was there was the era that was brought on by Saw and Hostel, which that was like just like be as gory as you can. Yeah. Yep. Mid 2000s torture porn. Like, it doesn't matter if it's scary. It just needs to be nasty, which is like there's like it's fun, but it's not what I want everything yeah. to be. <laughs> and 
So like for and then for a long time it turned into like just cheap like jump scares were the way of it. But then I feel like really stuff like A twenty four making like films like Hereditary and stuff like that. Like we're kind of getting a return to more like cerebral type horror and like atmospheric horror, yeah. which is really nice to see. And the games are kind of doing that as well, you know, like stuff like Phasmophobia, where it's like there aren't really that many jump scares in Phasmophobia. It's more just the dread of the environment that you're in and the atmosphere that's around you, you know? Which kind of surprised me for the fact that playing Phasmophobia and I loved it. And then I thought how has this not really been done this way? Or maybe it has, and it's just that it's something that never really gets discussed or never really brought up, so it never really popped up on my radar. Because I feel like horror games in general, unless you're something like Resident Evil or something like that with a big name behind it, they're not as often kind of popping up on things. Like, I know I have to personally go searching for them just because I enjoy them. And then you find some gems, but it's not something that's just generally... Oh yeah, next month we have these five horror games and Mario Maker or something. Yeah. I think with this one it's just it the bread and butter to the whole game is the voice. Like the fact that the ghost responds to your voice. If you say its name, it gets pissed off and it will more likely attack and hunt you. That, that was oh, my entire that. job on our crack team there. Is uh <laughs> you're in the van, Rachel is completing objectives, and my job is to antagonize the ghost. And <laughs> just talk shit. <laughs> Get down here, you nerd. <laughs> With so many games trying to incorporate voice into it, it becomes more of a gimmick that's never sold, like that that never delivered. And I think this is the only game where it actually has delivered because that is the main focus of it. You can still complete your hunt without actually saying a word, but being able to speak is a good like 30% of what you have to do. So not being able to speak, you can still play the game, but you're missing out on a huge chunk of the content without having it. How do the ghosts react to screaming? Because that would be me lots of the time. They love it. <laughs> Just They're eggs really them on. It's number two on their top three list. <laughs> yeah. Number one makes Next the dying. Too. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Death would be number one. Yeah. the I think Phasmophobia was the first game that we played as a group where we got out of Discord chat for our audio and actually played yes. in-game audio. And I think yeah, it, it audio elevates so it better. so much because of the proximity Absolutely. audio and then the radio receiver. So anybody within your proximity can hear you as you're talking in the game. And then you can access your radio, like essentially just hit your talk oh, radio yeah. button. To then radio yeah, back to, to everybody like else. But then there might That's be cool. static coming through. There might be other things. And if somebody gets captured or gets like killed, they just radio cut. You can't talk to them anymore. So it That's, might be, oh, I'm going to go yeah. check out this room. And I'm talking. And all of a sudden, it's just my radio cuts out. And you can't, unless you go searching for me, you don't know if I'm dead or not. Oh, God. Yeah, that sounds terrifying. Yeah, so <laughs> only game, but like that's that's just my own mental like what I believe in as a person like with ghosts and shit and like it it's too real for you. Perfectly. Yeah, it's one that I'm definitely I keep installed, and even though we haven't gone back to it recently, I'm keeping track of updates because I'm just waiting for kind of that like full release for all the the roadmap items. Because I definitely want to go back mm. into it at some point. I know when Cam was looking for stuff to do on stream as a group, I kept pitching to him, like, bring all the boys into Phasmophobia. And he's like, ah, we did it already. Yeah. Yeah, we had played it solo. And a lot of what, when Cam would do the streams, he'd want to do a lot of, like, kind of fresher stuff for us. Because trust me, I was behind the scenes too. Like, dude, we should do Faz. Absolutely, yeah. we should do Faz. I was pushing for it so hard, man. You know that entire game is made by one dude? No. Yeah, it's a one-man development team. It's a passion project. Yep. Wow. Yeah, and he <laughs> I, and like especially he's active as hell well, on it too. Like I have yeah the yeah. updates pushed to our Discord server because my partner plays it a ton still, and um, mm-hmm. I'm interested in looking out for those really big updates. And the last couple of them that went through, like, well, there's a huge quality of life changes because I can tell he's actually watching the streamers that are actively playing it. And mm-hmm. taking what they're saying to heart, like, well, this is what they're doing. I don't want them to do this. So let me try to change the right things to get them to go play it in the way that I designed the game to be played. And then other times yeah. where they're complaining about like, this is stupid. There's no reason to do this. So he'll buff items and stuff. And you can see like, if you watch the stream from like 
a week ago, like, oh, all of these things were said. And then the patch notes for today, you look through and you could see some of them are reflecting from that. So it is nice to see developers actually taking the gamers that are playing their product to heart and actually taking it into consideration. Yeah, and it is like I think that's really the incredible thing is the amount of work that's gone into it as a game that like like uh like you said, Tim, it's like no one's really done something like this before. I feel like this like on this level of interactivity with like the voice chat and everything and then like down to the ghosts having unique names every time you play. Obviously, they're drawing from a pool yeah. of like like some kind of name recognition database, but they give them first and last names every time you play. And to have one guy make a game where you can, like, by name address a ghost and it recognizes your speech, that's insane to it, me. It, the pool <laughs> like, is probably everybody that's ever crossed him in real life. Yeah. Like all ghosts now. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's such a, a cool idea. And knowing that he's putting that work in, I didn't realize it's one guy, like, I think the game was something like 20 bucks or something like that. But these are the kinds yeah, of like projects like 30, that it's like... Yeah. I would throw 60 bucks at this if I know this is going to this guy who's putting all this work in and is actually like caring about his project as opposed to like, oh, it's now this game is going to be $70 and it's EA cranked it out over like four years or something like that from a studio they bought. Yeah. Also, I would love to see him watching a stream and then crank out a hot fix that gets pushed during the stream. There's a ghost (laughs) coming and all of a sudden it's like, also, your legs don't move. Sorry, new topics. I think actually he has done that, but not to that <laughs> level of like comedy. Just like uh, yeah. next time you play, because <laughs> like there, there are. I mean, the game is still in um, beta, so when things happen, like one update will crat- catastrophically break something, and if he's watching a stream or playing it. That's like, all right, I just pushed it. He updated. He's playing the new version. And then like ghosts no longer hunt. It's like, well, obviously he has to go and fix it immediately. So he'll he'll do that and other like little minor yeah. changes. Yeah, I think it would be really cool. The one thing I could see, and this is definitely like a, a much larger scale operation goal. It wouldn't work with just one guy. But there was that. Do you guys remember? I think it was Cluster Truck that did it. The game where you're like hopping truck bed to truck bed. It was no. like a, a it was a real streamer bait type yeah, game. Yeah, I, I seen that. But one. uh. Yeah, there was a thing that they do sometimes where if they were, they basically put a functionality in the game where if they were watching a stream, they could interact with that streamer's game while it was happening. And they could like throw obstacles at them in real time and That's stuff. That's cool. That would be tight as hell for yeah. this game. Like if he could like basically as the developer or at this point, if it would move on to a development team and he could actually have people dedicated to this kind of thing. But if they could like stream snipe people and like <laughs> just mess with them at, like with like ghost functionalities. I feel like that'd be really cool to see. Just kind of like play around with their expectations a bit. I feel like that'd be really Plus, I feel like that's the main thing that would get me watching a Twitch stream of that game is knowing that you could play this game for a hundred hours, but when you get on that game, it might be something completely different because there's an actual person yeah. messing with it from the other side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that's definitely, that's kind of cool. I would love to see them take this whole idea a step further when the actual game comes out. And rather than just kind of going in, investigating the ghost, determining what type it is and whatnot, actually being able to perform like an exorcism at the house or something like that. Yeah. Just so you can actually do like a full completion on it. But I think if you have that power to actually eliminate the threat as part of your goal, that might take away some of the the scare aspect of it. So I, I don't know if they would ever end up doing something like that, but. Yeah, I mean, even just that idea, I actually like that idea a lot. And to kind of spitball it, I think a way that you could maintain the current tension and horror that like the that is derived from like the helplessness of your situation that the game currently has is uh, I'm not sure if you guys have played Payday 2, but Payday 2 functions in for some heists. It functions in like multiple days of the operation. Mm -hmm. So it could just be a two night thing where it's like night one is what the game is now where you're identifying the ghost and then night two is a more uh not action but like a bit more invested like now you're going there to ex- like to exercise this thing yeah. so night one will still play how the game plays now and you'll get that horror experience and then night two will be something a bit more like retaliatory yeah it kind of lets you go in and do something about I it thought about i would that too. like that could be i neat. was even thinking like by depending on how well you do in the investigation phase that in turn makes the exorcism phase that much easier or harder depending on how great that last team was yeah and that could be neat because then it's like, you know, you 
obviously having played it you've seen that like it's doing a lot of the more extensive uh objectives is is a bit more of a risk you end up uh much more likely to get got so that does kind of give you the risk reward of like okay our our exorcism will be easier if we risk this but we'll be putting ourselves at risk the whole time you know that would be cool because it's like it'll be much easier to exercise what it is if you know is it a ghost is it a demon what is it a poltergeist Mm -hmm. like what is it I'm going to be doing a Latin incantation. Great. It's not Latin. <laughs> yeah. You screwed it's up, like, buddy. Sorry, you're doing a prayer for a religion that this ghost does not follow. <laughs> you just bring your one cool. fourth player as a priest. He comes into the exorcism, steps out of a hallway and breaks his neck, leaves again. Yeah. Well. <laughs> oh, well. I like the idea of just four priests of different religions rolling in. Just like, we got our bases covered. One of us will be right. <laughs> yeah. I remember there was a, a comic years ago. Well, years ago. It was probably like four years back. I forgot the name of it. I think it was from like Image or something. But that was the whole okay. thing of it was like multiple priests from all different religions forming like this Justice League type situation of. Oh, yeah. dope. <laughs> so. That's, that's so dumb. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's dumb. Terrific. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, definitely phasmophobia. That one I would be down to play again at some point. We'll do a uh, a spook weekend or something and do like phasmophobia through the the night. Dean, you Dean, go. you can you can be the guy in the the van. You're the safest one. <laughs> Passing out snacks. What's, you are. What are the scares gotta... in the van? Like monitoring and hearing and like. Yeah, it helps. You can't you can't really get scared in the van. You're just watching <laughs> the screens and honestly, you're just watching your friends get picked off. It's yeah. Probably a good a uh, good a uh, uh, buffer to uh, going inside the house. Yeah. <laughs> you're just waiting at the doorway, just outside of the ghost's reach, passing out warm towels. <laughs> Goes any water? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, phasmophobia. Good pick. Dean, would you like to take your number three, or would you like? Sure. To that? Okay. So this goes very much in line with what Josh was talking about: subjective horror <laughs> <laughs> um, of a real terror. But uh, this game is not a horror game. But it was <laughs> scary Perfect to for me. This topic. So, you know, probably most of us, maybe most of us have seen Jaws at a young age, Mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was pretty young when I saw that. I'm the youngest of four. I have three older sisters, and they would constantly be renting movies and stuff I shouldn't have been watching. I don't know when and where I saw Jaws. I just know that it was very young, because I have a lifelong fear of sharks now. (laughs) Like, yep, just open water, I think, too, terrifies me, so... Since I was a Sega kid, my number three game is Echo the Dolphin. I like I put the pieces together right before you said it. You said Sega and I was like, no fucking way. <laughs> yeah. The intro's it, kinda creepy. It is a combination. The it is sound, a little bit. Yeah. The music and the sound effects are creepy to me. I just watched the playthrough again just to remind myself. But just like, I don't know why I even thought like I could rent this game and play it because I'm like terrified of sharks and just like horror games in general. I'm just like a scaredy cat. Like I, if I'm in control, I can like watch people play easier, have an easier time doing that. But if I'm in control, mm-hmm. I'm instantly like terrified. Like if it's a horror game. Especially first person, <laughs> so the phasmophobia <laughs> is probably gonna freak me out, regardless. Yeah. But with Echo, it's like I was just afraid. Oh my god, there's a shark. There's gonna be a shark somewhere. It's just like in my mind the whole time as a kid playing it. And there's let's just like that open wa- open water sense too, like around a lot of the levels. And it's just like a what's it called? Th- Thassalophobia. Yeah, with that the fear of like unknown deep water. Yes. Yeah, it's like thalassophobia or something like you that. You would hate Subnautica then. I was yeah, like I <laughs> laughed at Echo the Dolphin, then I'm thinking about it. I'm like, no, like that's the one of the creepiest things is when you're in a game and it's like underwater and it's like just past where you can see and you don't know what's there. Yeah. Yeah. I remember ages ago we had on PC, it was like a game, essentially like a Pokemon Snap type thing, where you oh. are traveling around like different time periods taking pictures of dinosaurs. And at one point you get in a, like a, a 
underwater like sub type thing and you go down to the ocean floor and it's like you can see 10 feet in front of your face and then it's pitch black but you see things slowly start coming towards you from the distance and they can kill you so you're like trying to whip around and see what's going on so i think i understand echo the dolphin <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean as in what an eight-year-old t- or something like that like yeah i just i, fear. I, mean, I was 27 <laughs> Nick had shaken fear by age eight, I think. Um, but with me, it was very much alive and well. And like, I it I don't know if I ever completed the game. Like, I did manage to get past sharks to just run away or get killed by them. You could you could kill them by running into them. But there's like the huge octopus. There's like other like kind of like monster creatures in the game. I never really beat it. My list is more so based on my terror level, not like this is like the best horror game, but this is just like memorably yeah. <laughs> me being scared <laughs> by games, and it's a very you know subjective and unique list. Uh, I mean, my other games are horror games, but yeah, Echo the Dolphin. I think any game with a shark in it ties for third <laughs> for me here. There you go. <laughs> so that runs like, a very wide gamut, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, that puts Freddy Fish on the list. <laughs> oh, God. Hey, Freddy, bet you can't swim a loop-de-loop. No, 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 no. Hell no. Like, I love <laughs> Assassin's Creed Black Flag, and I'm like, I can never 100% this game because there's so many underwater shark, like, levels. I'm like, fuck it. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> yeah. Do you do any, uh, have you guys played any Sea of Thieves? Yeah. Yes. How do you handle that? I enjoy it, but I definitely, the first time I played it, because I played it alone, because I I tried to get everybody into it, and at the time it was too early in it, so there wasn't a ton to do. So it was just like Mm -hmm. sail around and enjoy. And then the first time my ship went down, I felt that twinge of terror that I didn't have in like a very long time (laughs) of like, Mm -hmm. I'm in the water and I'm looking around and it's like, there is no land around and I know there's other stuff in this water right now. And I yeah. loved it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, that swings you to the, uh, that swings you to a happy place. That swings me to, like, get me the hell out of here. I'm not having fun. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. I'm not enjoying it. I'm just like, let me, let me just go underwater and drown, and it'll port me back to land somewhere. <laughs> just um, having a flintlock pistol with one ball. <laughs> Funny with, the shark. with Sea of me. Thieves, I'm not actually afraid of what's under the water, but actually what's above it. Because when it comes to the players, it's that constant dread of, am I going to get robbed at any second? Yeah. It's like walking through a rough neighborhood every night after work. <laughs> Man is always home. the greatest horror. Like that, that's probably the only dread I really felt playing through that because it was so frustrating. Like, I get the title of the game. It's Sea of Thieves. I get it in that argument of like, well, if you don't like it, don't play it. But it's frustrating because it's like, I just want to be by myself. And I don't want to have to worry about like every time you see a mast on the horizon that's not, you know, like a ghost ship or a pirate ship or like a skeleton ship, whatever. Whenever you see one, it's like, is it heading in my direction? And then like that actual like, oh, shit, let me if this is one of those moments where like if you're in your car, this is where you would lock your doors. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> so like, oh god. <laughs> and like I don't trust that at all. You're at like the, the mast on your boat just like furiously hitting the lock button. <laughs> 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 the sails go up. <laughs> Captain look. <laughs> <laughs> um just also Classic. a special fuck you to Tiny from Batman Arkham City. That's the penguin shark in that level if you remember. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> One of the most scariest, because you know, it's totally unexpected, and I was just like, "That Have that, you, uh, that, was, that was great." This will probably come up again because, again, it's definitely going to come up. I'm on this episode, but <laughs> I, I don't know how much Resident Evil you've done, but the shark segment in Resi One is like not okay. I looked up. <laughs> I looked up like, "Oh, what are some other sharks in games?" Just to jog my memory, and that was on like everybody's list. Neptune from yeah. Resident Evil One. Yeah, well, it's like it dude, looks you go freaky. into a room. Yeah, well, you go into a room and it's like, oh, cool, there's some water here. And then all of a sudden, just a shark is coming at you. And you're, yeah. like, you're in, you're in like, knee-high water. You're slowed down. So you're just like, oh, God. Oh, God. Like, try to just get away. And you're working against friggin' tank controls. And there's this, like, 10-foot-long shark like trying to eat your model. ass. Like, yeah, exactly. No, it's the worst, dude. I've been training for this. Yeah, um, he, like, he, like yeah. when he gets you, he gets you. Like, it's bad, dude. <laughs> 
So I think we've cracked the code for how to add raw fear into a game. It's just have a you deep water sharks. level with a shark. <laughs> yeah. Phasmophobia, but you know, you're underwater looking for sharks. Yeah. yeah. A ghost oh, shark. God. You walk in and they have an indoor pool and it's like, eh. <laughs> you can agitate the sharks by yelling at them. <laughs> just bleeding in the water. Smile, you son yeah. of a bitch. <laughs> well, that's day two. When the priests come in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but they say Action it in Latin. segment. <laughs> Shark priest. <laughs> That's a movie I'm going to I'm gonna make that there movie. You go, so, yeah. Let's trademark it. I mean, we had a... Uh, maybe a graphic, maybe a graphic novel. I'm sure we could have Shark Pastor. Priest. <laughs> yeah, so, start off as a graphic novel. I think uh, Echo the Dolphin. It's one of the great horror games of our time. <laughs> great <team>. horror games. <laughs> I respect the hell out of that pick, man. That's it's great. It's unconventional, <laughs> but you, you backed I it up. I love it. That's what I'm here for, is the unconventional choice. So, my number three uh, was released my freshman year of college back in October of 2008 on PS3 and 360. Uh, I ended up playing it at the time on PS3. It is a survival game from EA. So, anybody that's heard of Dead Space? Twinkle, twinkle, little So everybody, I assume, knows this is the game. Uh, it started getting action-y over time, like by Dead Space 3. They added co-op, which I love co-op. Co-op's one of my favorite things growing up, like playing games with my brother side by side. But in horror, adding co-op, I mean, other, actually, Phasmophobia probably just proved me wrong. I felt like adding co-op in a horror game always detracts a little bit from it, just for the fact that now you're not alone. You don't have that single player experience. You have somebody else to kind of share it with. Uh, but it yeah. was built from the ground up to be experienced as co-op with Phasmophobia. True. Yeah. Dead rather Space than having a, yeah, was not. And they just, how do we keep this, you know, dead horse moving? So let's, uh, let's add co-op into it and change the format. Yeah. And three was rough in general. Cause three was also like way less necromorphs and way more guys with guns that you were fighting. Yeah. I do think the addition of co-op in 3 had one really cool functionality because you could only play it online and basically Isaac and the I can't remember the other guy's name he was only in the third one and I barely played 3 well I, I played it but I played it like once yeah how many times I've played one and two um but the whole idea was that even in co-op you could the game would sometimes replace the model of your partner on your screen with a necromorph um in firefights and stuff and it fire a t uh, friendly fire would be on so you'd think your partner was a necromorph because canonically the marker was like infecting your mind and trying huh. to get you to kill each other. And that was really cool. But it still did sacrifice a ton of just the horror for like one cool functionality. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Which by the time the third one came out, I had kind of lost like my brother had moved on. So I had lost my permanent co-op partner. So I mm -hmm. had to play three single player at that point. Yeah. But that's the kind of interesting things that they throw into otherwise uninteresting sequels that it's like yeah <laughs> such a cool idea though yeah i just wish it was used in a better game yeah reminds me of like the thing and stuff yeah you don't you yeah. don't know if you can trust the other person yeah exactly how do you feel about uh callisto protocol i don't know callisto protocol nope so Callisto Protocol is a game that was announced at the Game Awards last year. It's basically so Visceral isn't a studio anymore, but the guys from Visceral, Visceral are in a different studio. And I unfortunately can't remember what it's called right now. But basically, Callisto Protocol is a new game they're making that is just Dead Space. Oh, um, and it's the Visceral team. I would look it up. It's so funny enough. The the weirdest part of this is like if you watch the trailer, it is Dead Space. It's it's nasty body horror space, like very thing inspired, really cool looking trailer. And then <laughs> you find out that this new Visceral studio is owned by the company that makes PUBG. And this is that th 
thing that they referenced a long time ago where they were like, we're making a single player experience in the PUBG universe. It's this. But this game takes place thousands of years in the future in space, and it's a horror game. So what a lot of people are thinking is like they're just kind of using that as like a yeah, ha ha, it's a PUBG game, even though it's really not. Yeah. Um, But it is like it's that's just a weird, like dumb fun fact. The game itself looks really cool conceptually. We only have like a, a concept trailer right now, no gameplay. But if you look it up, like I said, it's I'm like 99% sure it's Callisto Protocol, but it's uh, it looks great. It looks really, really cool. And there was a Red Band trailer that showed off some, like, body horror transformation stuff that looked I could awesome. That. I like the little yeah. teaser poster was reminiscent of, like, Alien 3. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, it looks really cool. And then the eventual uh, Battle Royale add-on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ten guys land on a ship. One of them's a monster. Seems sus. Amagus. <laughs> Actually, they should just do, the, just do a thing, like John Carpenter's The Thing game. Like, I know they already made one, but do it where it's a multiplayer, one person's the thing, and then you just have to bump off everybody uh, else from there. While, uh, well, it's actually, as you said, it, it would just end up being uh, Among Us, but yeah, better animation. No, I mean, yeah, it's cool. It's, I mean, there's, there's like, there's always room for another, like, social deduction type. Game. Yeah. Like, they're fun, you know? And I'd be down for them to do anything with the thing IP, really. Yeah. The PlayStation game wasn't bad. It was good. No, the PlayStation game was actually cool. That was like, I played that one right around when I played, um, oh God, what was it called? There was another one. It was a kind of Resident Evil clone. You were on an oil tanker. Oh, it was like, uh, I just remember it was fear? raining all the time. Cold Fear. Yeah. I remember playing Cold Fear right around. Like, I the remember cover seeing is those like two a games. Close up of a EV guy games. with a wrench or something like that. With a wrench. wrench yeah. And he's pointing the gun at him. Yeah. He's got like the, the old red and orange coat on. Yeah. But yeah, no, so. So, actually, I probably should have let it for any listeners out there who are unfamiliar with Dead Space. Oh, they uh, know what it is. <laughs> so the game follows uh, Isaac Clark as he and the crew of the Kellyan travel to uh, explore a missing mining ship, the Ishimura, which right off the bat, this is tossing out classic, like, alien event horizon vibes of a blue-collar crew yeah. exploring a, like, a distant deep space location or unknown ship. So we have the Ishimura, which was at Aegis 7 Colony, which was... It was there to harvest resources. It's a planet cracker. It's like an illegal mining operation. And the colony contains something called the Red Marker that Josh mentioned before, which releases this virus of sorts causing like mass hallucinations, psychosis, general body horror. The people end up like any bodies. They're turning into like these creatures that are like these Carpenter Cronenbergian things with like you shoot their head off. The body still crawls after you. You shoot an arm off. It's still coming after you. Like all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so everybody kind of ter- tears each other apart from there. And Isaac has invested the whole thing because his girlfriend is one of the people on the Ishimura. She was one of the crew and she's missing. So I remember, as I said, like this came out my freshman year and I was excited for it. I sat down in my room. It was like turned all the lights off, closed the windows, cracked this game open. And for the first time since I was like a young child, I remember being uncomfortable from playing a game like actual dread just because usually in shooters, they don't make me anxious because of you have so much control in the shooter of my skill and my ability. I can kind of control the situation in this, but having that limited ammo, the ambience of the ship itself, things that get back up and crawl after you after you're shooting it a bunch of times, things popping out of air vents for just like the, the jump scare aspect. I'll, never forget that for the first time and i keep searching to see if they're ever working on a live action movie for this the game doesn't scare yeah. me but the fact that the way you said it i 100 percent agree the game does unnerve me yeah. i'm not scared yeah. but there are times where like in the first it's always that first hour you play it you're not in that mindset yet <clears throat> you already know what to expect but the fact that they give you like no ammo you're hearing shit all over the place all around you and the intentional yeah. like jump scares of like you'll see something clearly not a rat go through like a vent and you're just waiting for it to attack you and it never does. Yeah. And I think this was one of those games too where they flat out said, look, you know, Resident Evil, you walk into a safe room, the music starts playing, you know you're safe. This game does not have that. So you never know when you are indeed safe because the music is haunting as it is. It just kind of loops and it never gives you any kind yeah. of social cues to know that like, I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah, you never really know. Uh, Dead Space sticks out for me. I love that game. I beat it over a weekend when I rented it from a Blockbuster near my house, actually. There was still one in 
in service at that point near me. <laughs> so if you want to do something exciting tonight, make it a blockbuster night. <laughs> but I remember the big thing about it was, I think the biggest thing as far as like horror game design stuff goes, I think it's really cool that most horror games, I'm sure you guys are familiar, will like the first time you see an enemy, you see it from afar, you see it in a cutscene, something like that to introduce you to the fact that, hey, this is like what you're going to be fighting. Even like all the way back to Resident Evil's very famous, the cutscene of the zombie eating the, the helicopter pilot or whatever. This game, it, from what I remember, it always stands out to me as the first necromorph you find just kind of gets dropped on you and you have to run from it. It doesn't really give you like a look at how fucked up this yeah. thing is. It's just like, oh, it's here. It's trying to kill you. Get away. Yeah. So you get that very raw, like, what the hell is that thing? But like, you don't really have time to take it in because it's like, it's very much, like I said, like on top of you trying to kill you. I, I always thought that was really yeah. cool. Or like having limited ammo already with kind of these you don't have a lot of guns in terms of, oh, I have like a rocket launcher and a flamethrower. It's like you have yeah. all of these types of tools that would normally be used for like mining or like utility things. So you have like a, a mm -hmm. rivet gun and stuff like that um, or like a line I gun. Slapped. And then you come across something that regenerates back and you just wasted a majority of your ammo trying to take this thing down. And then it just like gets <laughs> back up. And you don't realize it because you thought, oh, it's on the ground. You get up, you walk away, you're going to do something else. And then you just get grabbed from behind. That's the kind of stuff that just makes Dead Space stand out for me. I still love it, which I'm still hoping eventually, like, give us a movie. It's the kind of thing that would be awesome. I was really hoping yeah. something like Pandorum um, back when that came out with uh, Ben Foster and um, Dennis Quaid would be the case. Because yeah. it's like, oh, it's like it's in space and it's all of these kind of not creatures, but kind of creatures. And then I ended up watching a movie and I enjoyed it, but it was less kind of necromorphs and more along the lines of something like Ghosts of Mars or the Descent kind of creatures. Um, it's yeah. more very humanoid, like humans self-mutilating from space psychosis kind of deal. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Dead Space. That's a good one. I feel like, um, oh, what's it called? What was that one? I think Natalie Portman was the lead in it. Um, oh, um, it was a uh, sci-fi... Annihilation? Yeah. Yes, with the bear yep. and everything. That was, that was like, getting there. Yeah. Like, that bear scene gave me big Dead Space vibes. Like, if it if the marker managed to hit Earth type thing. Yeah. Like, that, that kind of gave me those scene. ideas. <laughs> yeah, the bear was messed up. Like, I, I don't know. I think it was just fucked expect... up how they designed it. Like, yeah. Yeah. I didn't expect Annihilation going in to be a horror movie, really. I expected more sci-fi. And I was watching, I was like, oh, yep. shit, okay. <laughs> Here we go, like, I guess. All of, I was really expecting, as he said, like, a, I was told, oh, it's based on this sci-fi book. I was like, okay, like, I can dig it. I like sci-fi. And then I'm watching it and I'm getting excited because it's like, no, this is getting into like cosmic body horror for a lot of this yeah. stuff. Yeah, I also think um, Natalie Portman being the lead in that was like, I, I don't see her in horror projects really ever. So that was like, oh, all right. That also just threw my expectation completely. Yeah, because you know? it's her closest stuff, I think, like gets into the not horror, but like more of the, the dark psychological stuff with like Black Swan. Black Swan is the but only that was like tiptoeing yeah. around that kind of stuff. And then this goes yeah, directly in. Really... in. So yeah. this is closer <laughs> to like uh, color out of space than anything else for Annihilation. Yeah. So yeah, that's that I dig. And so give us uh, give us a Dead Space movie, and I'll be happy. I mean, a, de a Dead Space movie like you wouldn't have to like really stick to canon. Like there'd be certain elements, right? Like just the would you want it to follow the story of the game, or can they just use the world they've created as like a? I mean. I don't even care. Horror in that world. Well, I'm not terribly... In, it's, a, it's a good story. I dig the story. But at the end of the day, if they just put it on a derelict ship with, like, body horror creatures, <laughs> I'll watch it. That's all I really yeah. want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, there was an animated movie for Dead yeah. Space. I can't remember what it's called, but it was, like, a little... I want to say, like, like Helix uh, or something? Because I remember like that, it was yeah. the, the cover was, like, the eye with, like, the Helix thing directly... Yeah, yeah, the marker going oh, wasn't at Wasn't there it. one where there's like a severed arm floating through space? Yes. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the box yeah. art for the game. Is it? I thought there was a different yeah. one. I think there was an alt one. The or so I remember Game Informer when they did their uh, cover story on. I always loved that art where it's Isaac just surrounded by necromorphs. Um, and I always thought that one was really cool. But I think the arm is like the standard, unless maybe no. there's like an oh, overseas. So yeah, it's called Downfall. Yeah, because there was Downfall, two movies. Okay. The one I we were thinking yeah. of with the marker in the eye, that's Aftermath, and then the one Nick was thinking of was Downfall. 
Yeah, because I was gonna say if they were to do a live action movie, I would really like and like just the Ishimura when they get the marker on board to when Isaac arrives. Like the last scene could be Isaac getting onto the Ishimura, and like then you kind of know what happens from there. But I would like just kind of showing how the marker affected people and kind of drove them crazy and started changing them and stuff. I mean, hell, give us like an HBO Max or Netflix series. That would work Six really episodes. well. There's a lot of like. <laughs> yeah, you could do a lot of really good dramatic storytelling with the the cult that arose out of the people that were like worshiping the yeah. marker and stuff like that, and the like the conflict just of like the people versus like why the hell are you worshiping this big space tower? Yeah, like, what's wrong with you? I think that um, now that Disney is starting to put more into its like Disney Plus shows, like after mm-hmm. the Mandalorian and WandaVision, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, they're doing such a great job of taking these movie quality properties and turning it into a television show that i'm starting to think that more because that originally was just like hbo that was really kind of knocking them out of the park Mm -hmm. usually it's either based on factual stuff like band of brothers chernobyl and then doing their own thing with like you know sopranos sex in the city that sort of shit but i think now disney is showing like this is a thing and especially thanks to covid movies won't ever go away but I don't think it'll be anytime soon where we'll be able to go back into the theaters like we used to. Like, I don't think a Dead Space movie would ever work in the same vein, like how the Doom movie didn't work and how like certain yeah. other properties. It's just there's too much stuff to throw into a two hour movie because you're just either the movie's going to fail because it's going to cater to the game too much and it's not going to bring in a good enough of an audience. Or it's going to avoid the game entirely to bring in as many people as possible. And it's going to piss off the fans. Because every game, every video game movie that comes out or something similar to that, like the, like the um, recent the topical subject, with the recent release of like Mortal Kombat, like the, the yeah. reviews are so split. Either you really liked it or you hated it and there's really no in between. So I feel Dead Space would be the perfect kind of property to have on HBO and or any other major streaming service <laughs> can you imagine disney plus now i was gonna say when, when you mentioned disney plus i was gonna be like disney's dead space okay i can dig it yeah <laughs> but uh yeah i think like i it would do so much more for that property to be a 10-part mini series and that's it you know yeah like a not like a multiple season thing just do like a one shot just like multiple episode thing. I can totally see With that. With how many movies right. they've been wanting to release too. Cause I've heard like there's a Metal Gear Solid movie in development for the last 20 years. Yeah. There's a um, Uncharted game that's supposed to um, movie that's supposed to be coming out. I think it actually is, but I don't know. Bioshock yeah, that one is. is another one that's supposed to come out. Like these are amazing titles that would transition from video game to movie. I think that could work, but no one can write that movie. It's impossible. Yeah. There's no way that you can write it so that you can get that same experience as finding out would you kindly in the same kind of medium as watching it on TV. There's no way. Yeah, you need that long term investment. And like no Bioshock movie is going to adequately like explore all of the weird like themes of like anti-capitalism and like all these different things that Bioshock did, all these like socio-political commentaries that Bioshock engaged in. You can't do that in like an hour and a half, two hour movie and also be like, haha, cool superpowers, big monster yeah. fight. Like you can't do both in a movie. Like, yeah. Whereas if you have those like a six to eight hours of material to work with and explore those themes, that's much more viable. I'm really glad that uh, that Last of Us is getting a series and not a movie. Yeah. I think that's way more appropriate for the story that they're going to tell. Yeah, I, I feel like that more and more, I think, with just uh, IPs being adapted, it's like. With the quality of television, you know, since 2010 or, you know, or maybe earlier, just that shows are are, are cinematic now. And it's like, yeah, mm-hmm. give them the budgets and let's let's tell the full thing without trying to rush it in an hour and a half or two hours. Plus, yeah. I feel like something like horror, even though it is popular, it's always been that fringe genre that studios don't want to take a risk on big budget horror. It was probably like one of the the ones in recent memory when they did it chapter one and two where they put money behind it. But what well, they put money behind it. Uh, but it was something <laughs> that they that's why usually a lot of them are like low budget horror or things like that. I feel like with a series, it takes some of the risk away for the fact that 
I don't need to convince somebody to leave their house on like a Friday night and go to the theater and pay $15. All I need them to do is sit down on a couch at some point whenever they want and just flip this on on a system or on like a uh, streaming service that they already own. Yeah. Horror is all about the investment because you can't easily sell it to somebody. Like, yeah, it's scary, but with video games especially, there's a lot of build up that you are personally experiencing. And seeing that on a, a, a movie, just you can't do that in a fast enough amount yeah. of time. That's why, like, Alien, The Thing, fuck, like, Psycho. Like, those movies were so culturally shocking because at the time, like, no one's done that before. So it's easy to hook them in because no one's done it. But now that we have, like, I don't think anyone's going to care about another movie set in space that follows people infected by some random biological like thing that was discovered and they unwilling or unknowingly brought it on board and you know it infected everyone and it's too bad but <laughs> describing yeah. that plot and then as you're saying it it's like yeah actually if you just said that four movies probably pop up yep yeah <laughs> <laughs> so, i mean really when you think about it like you know dead space is pretty much alien yeah yeah it really gets there where it's like it's even down to the the people being like the vessels that these things reproduce through, you know? Yeah. So at some point, I'm sure we'll have a rule of thirds episode of horror movies, which I would be down for. Also, if maybe they don't do Dead Space as a series, do it as a VR experience. Let me watch a Dead Space movie in VR where I'm Isaac Clark. It'd be crazy that'd trying be cool. to like that's the, that would I be think terrifying. That it's probably the the best thing that made you or like when you first played dead space like yeah it's scary it's 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 really well done but the shining thing to make it stand up amongst like stand above all the rest of when it came out was the fact that you're warned leading all the way up to your first encounter by the time you get your first quote-unquote gun don't aim for the head you have to remove the limbs yeah and that mentality throughout the whole rest of the game like is so like it's game changing because it's no longer like oh it's another zombie thing to shoot him in the head why can't i shoot him in the head every zombie game you can't shoot them in the fucking head i never understood that but then in this it's like no you don't want the head you need to go for the limbs and then it's that peril of like you trying to take off the limbs as it's like charging at you is yeah. so fucking cool yeah so yeah dead space good one Number twos. All right. So yeah, my number two, funny enough. So this is, these are the two that align. My number two are the same on both of my lists and my number one are the same on both of my lists. <laughs> um, so funny enough, it just kind of worked out like that. But uh, my number two pick is PT. Which it's kind of a stretch to call it a game, but I think that it is incredibly important to horror games and also just i think one of the most masterfully executed horror experiences that i've personally experienced so pt in case you're not familiar uh stands for playable teaser pt was uploaded uh i want to say it was 2014 or 2015 i think i was in college so it was 2015 but it might have been 2014 either way Right around there, it got uploaded to the PlayStation Store, kind of out of nowhere, quietly, just a little game that went up. The picture for it was just like a forest with some trees, and when you boot it up, you just kind of wake up in this this room with a lamp swinging over your head and one door to go through. You go through that door, you end up in this nice like house hallway, and you start kind of looking around. There's not really much to see. It's a very pretty game right off the bat. It looks incredible, and you're just kind of roaming through this house, and you get all the way down to the end of this hallway. It's like an L-shaped hallway with some other doors that are all locked around you and some pictures, stuff like that. You open this door at the end of the hallway and you're right back at the beginning. And, you know, you go through again. You run through this thing. Doesn't seem like anything's really changed. Right back at the beginning at the end of it. And you realize that you're caught in this loop. And then, the game never really tells you what to do. At any point, does it explicitly tell you do this? All it does is use very subtle environmental clues to give you an idea of what you should be doing. And this basically triggered this big sort of like, a, it's almost like an ARG in how it was executed. And like, uh, if you guys are familiar with like different kind of like uh, 
ARGs that have occurred for like advertising purposes over the years where like you have that community engagement of everyone coming together on a forum being like, what the hell is this? How do we do it? People kind of compiling strategies on how to progress. Uh, and at a certain point, after you progress enough, you start to see this ghost in the hallway named Lisa. And, like, I don't, a lot of people have seen PT. It got a lot of traction because it was right around, like, like game streaming and, and video gaming YouTubers were already big at that point. So, like, a lot of people have seen PT and have seen Lisa. And, like, man, for a ghost design, Lisa's fucked up. Like, she's <laughs> so creepy. Yeah. Lisa scared the absolute shit out of me the first time yes. I played this game. And it was the kind of thing where, like, I got PT, like, I think, like, a couple hours after it came out, because I remember seeing posts about it and being like, hey, like, what is this? And I, I didn't just get it randomly. I saw people talking about it, so I picked it up. I didn't see them talking about it really being horror. I just saw them talking about it. So I was playing, and then, like, uh, you know, I'm playing with my brother. So he's, my brother's three years younger than me. So I'm, like, right around, like, 18, 19 at this point. And we're playing, and, like, we get to the point where, like, you first come around the corner and Lisa's, like, in the hallway under that light. <laughs> And then, like, you take, like, another step or two forward and the light goes out and she's just gone. And I was like, oh, man, like, what are they doing, dude? <laughs> and this all, this whole experience culminates uh, through a bunch of very obtuse and hard to figure out clues and just crazy shit. And, like, you know, you're you're talking to this ghost and you're doing, you're, like, taking certain amounts of steps and stuff like that. And it ends up where at the end of this demo, you get out of this you get out of the house and the camera then you know is in first person for a bit of you walking down the street and then it pans out and it reveals that the character you've been playing as is actually played by norman reedus and this is the point where the title of the game pans in and so like there was i got hit by like six different things during this <laughs> ending sequence because first you get the norman reedus revealed which is already like oh cool like i watch walking dead I i've seen boondock saints i like norman reedus and then Silent Hill pops up on screen <laughs> and like it specifically goes like Silent Hill and then like an S appears at the end. So it's Silent Hills. And then they put Hideo Kojima over the top of it. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the point where like. I, I always really liked the Metal Gear games. I was into the Metal Gear games for, like since I was a little kid because my one of my older stepbrothers really, really liked them. I remember watching him play through four and it like changing my life. So <laughs> I was watching this and like, I already loved Silent Hill. Um, Silent Hill 2 just barely didn't make it onto my top three personal ones. It was like, it was Hunter the Reckoning or that was going to be my number three. So uh, I always had an attachment to the series. Me and my brother used to play it like crazy, especially the first one. And then this reveal happened that like the Silent Hill series, which had been dormant for so long, was coming back. And it was good. It was scary because we had had a lot of like not good Silent Hill games at that point. We'd had like Shattered Memories. We had Book of Shadows. Yeah. Even like the decent ones. Like a lot of people hate Homecoming. I don't hate it. It's just not great. And then um, Downpour was actually like decent, but it was good. It was scary. It scared me like one scared me way back when. And, you know, then you it started coming out more that Guillermo del Toro was also attached to this project. Junji Ito was also attached to this project, one of, like, the most prolific Japanese horror manga authors that exists. Like, all this incredible talent was attached to this thing, and then Konami killed it. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> project got killed off. It's still, as of now, not confirmed to be rehappening, even though we get a rumor every week or two. If you listen to Into the Video Game, you know that Cam is constantly tormenting <laughs> me about this. Uh, it comes up so frequently. But, yeah, it's just... uh. I think PT is one of those things that, like, the tone of PT has carried into so many modern horror projects that, like, that very quiet uncertainty, like, no music, a lot of just, like, really focusing on the atmosphere of what you're doing has really carried over into a lot of modern horror. And I think a lot of that is due to how much of, like, a force PT was as far as, like, getting spread around on social media outlets, like, like, gameplay, like, gameplay channels and stuff like that. A lot of people are getting those reactions out there. Like you get stuff like PewDiePie playing it and Game Grumps playing it and stuff like that. And I think that kind of really lended a lot to the medium ending up where it is now, where like now we have a lot more horror that's focused on the atmosphere and not just like a thing jumping out and screaming at you. You know, yeah. we stopped getting outlasts and we started getting stuff like Phasmophobia. So, and I think a lot of that is due to how how present PT was. In, and and continues to be people are still like i said ev like every week there's a rumor about pt coming back <laughs> yeah which i think that's also we mentioned you mentioned it earlier kind of the rise of a24 films 
over the past yeah. several years. It's relying more on throughout like the the sixties of okay, like we we can do gore now, guys. We're not being stopped. So yeah. they can start doing like the old like Herschel Gordon Lewis. We get the seventies with like Cannibal Holocaust and the video nasties, the eighties of all of yep. like the balls to the wall crazy of the like slashers and things. Now we're finally at the point where it's like the the very subtle kind of something's kind of wrong here and then building up to kind of that fever pitch at the end for the last 15 minutes. And I feel like PT, yeah. it's that craziness of, as you said, there's no tutorial, there's nothing. So as time goes on, you're just kind of exploring and then all of a sudden, oh, okay, well, there's nowhere else to go. I made it to the end here. And then you're back at the beginning and it's, okay, well, now something's wrong. And it's, at that point, they could have done anything and it would have been frightening. Just like, oh, there's a light that flickers in the window outside and it would have made you jump just because now you're uneasy from this entire ambiance. Yeah. And I still think, I think honestly, the best executed scare in that game, it game, but in that demo, is at one point the ra- so there's a radio that kind of turns on and off as you as you play and like it says different things and stuff like that and a lot of the time it's talking about the story of what happened in this house which was this this husband murdered his pregnant wife in their house and the the ghost is now the ghost that's chasing you the wife is the ghost that's chasing you that's Lisa but there's a point where this voice that's been talking the whole time like stops talking and then just says like like he's just talking like he's a radio broadcast but he just goes. And if you don't move, it goes. And that, let me tell you, (laughs) I was like, it was like, I think it was probably like, because we, me and my brother stayed up for like hours playing this. We downloaded it at like nine or 10. And I think we were up to like three or four, like just messing with it because we didn't beat it that night. It was like impossible for the first like couple nights to finish, really. But we were playing it and it was like two or three a.m. And we're tired, and it's dark, and this thing tells me to turn around, and I'm just like, No! (laughs) Like, I'm simultaneously not and am having a good time. (laughs) 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 It's just, man, that was such, like, a visceral reaction of, like, oh, this thing's, now it's doing the meta thing, which, like, wasn't really, I feel like meta meta commentary in games and stuff has really been popularized, where, like, it's happening in a lot more stuff because stuff like Undertale and Omori and stuff like that. So, like, at this point, that wasn't really a thing yet. Yeah. (laughs) So it was kind of like, oh, okay, all right, I'm scared now. (laughs) That had to have been something they were at the pitch meeting. Kojima was like, you know, it would be cool. (laughs) 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 That's like his old psychomantis ways coming back. Yeah, exactly. And he's always been so good at that kind of stuff. Like, that was that was really where I think that his his influence would have shown really well, because I think that the way that Kojima writes Metal Gear could lend itself very well to horror. I don't know, if, like, if you play Metal Gear 2, when, like, the, um... The vampire? It's, not even the vampire, but on the radio, when he's, um, when he's talking to Raiden, like, his, the, the... Is oh, it the general? yeah, he, he's, like, Shepherd, when his out. face turns into the skull? Yeah, oh, like, he's oh, freaking oh. out, his face turns into the skull and everything. Like, that scared me when I was a kid. <laughs> and, like, that, if utilized in a more, like, intentionally horror aspect, could be really cool. Yeah, like there's just I feel like a lot of the way that Kojima interacts with the player in his games could be used for horror. He just doesn't really use it for that, which is fine. But like, imagine if the Psycho Mantis thing, you know, way back when, like that Mm. was crazy because you were like, whoa, he's psychic. Yeah. But imagine if he was trying to scare the shit out of you. (laughs) Like he could have, you know, it just like the whole time sends somebody or like orders a pizza to your house. And then then, like there's a knock at the door. (laughs) (laughs) Bro, I got pizza. (laughs) Pay an extra fifty dollars for the full experience. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You got to pay an extra like twenty five bucks for the game. It's like a, you Hideo, get a pizza out of it's it. It's like a Hideo like service, like monthly subscription. Like, have Hideo personally scare you <laughs> with the games he designs. Dude, I would like no hesitation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm such a friggin' shill, man. Like, I'd be on that. So Shut up fast. and take my money. Yeah, exactly. I think we've got a, I think we've got an idea here, gentlemen. Yeah, now we just might, have to get Kojima on board. Might take a lot of capital, but uh, <laughs> PT was one of the first things, first not first, but like rarely one of those games that I like. I think I had heard of it. I knew it was scary, 
I think my wife and I were just like, let's play it together. We played let's it all together. Yeah. The three, the f- yeah. She brought that up. She was like, weren't Tim, yeah. weren't Tim and Nick here too? I'm like, yeah, I think so. I think I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember we like planned on all getting together at your apartment when you were still living around here. And then we just like <laughs> sat down as a group and started going through. And then it was passing the controller around of, I don't want to be in control of this. <laughs> because <laughs> i That'd remember be going through as the like the the controller person and as we're doing it i'm like i feel uncomfortable and i'm really glad that i am because like it's so much fun but at the same time i don't want to look behind me i don't want to check out that thing over there <laughs> yeah like, <laughs> wasn't that look behind you isn't it was it that or later on where like you do look behind you and there's nothing, but then you turn around the other way and like she like decapitates you? That's, like, yeah, it's the same thing. That's when right. you die for the first time. Right. Yeah. That freaked me out. Yeah. Because they it's it's that classic thing where they misdirection. It's like they cut the tension because okay, there's nothing there, but she's actually the other way. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But it was really there effective. Was even like, yeah, they do those things where like Kojima in a lot of his game design does things that the player might never even see, but they're just good for the experience if you were to somehow find it out. And a big one that I I know just last year it was a story that someone managed to break the camera on it. Oh, yes. And they found out that, yeah, in the final hallway of the game, Lisa's constantly behind you the whole entire time you're there. She just floats behind you, directly behind you the entire time. And like she's doing like the freak out head thing where her head's snapping around and everything. And you can tell because when you play it, every now and then your light will cast a shadow of Lisa with like the head freaking out. But people didn't know why. It was weird because it was like, oh, it's just casting her shadow, but she's not here. She doesn't kill you in that hallway. But yeah, she's just constantly about like six inches behind your player model, <laughs> directly behind you, which is like you would never know. But it's really cool that he did it. Like- yeah. So I know I said, give me Dead Space VR experience. But can we make <laughs> PT on like Oculus? <laughs> Please no. I just want them to make it on anything. True, man. yeah. <laughs> they pulled the demo. Yeah, they did. I uh, I actually, unfortunately, way back when, I didn't realize that you couldn't re-download it if you didn't own it. And I upgraded from a standard PS4 to a Pro, and I lost my access. Cam still has a PlayStation that yeah. has it on it, though. I remember when I found out once you, like, that they took it off the store, I still had it on my um, PlayStation at the time. So I was like, oh, like, I still have it. And then eventually I had to get rid of my PlayStation because I was like, but I don't want to lose this. So I did a system backup to a hard drive. And then I just named that hard drive PT demo. So now I just have a hard drive kicking around that I'm like, I wonder if I were to buy another PS4. Could I just. Yeah, if it would work. Load it back in and just be like, and restore from here. Yeah, I was just going to say, awesome. I heard I, I know people still like it just says in March, March of this year. Like, people are still listing their PS4, like, and it's got PT on it. Like, it's on the hard drive. Like, that's yeah, still, yeah. like, a selling point for old PS4s. And they, yeah, they, until... they, they inflate the price of the PS4, too. Oh, absolutely. Until Konami decides to... There's a very specific set of circumstances that have to occur for that to not be the case anymore. And it's that Konami has to decide to go forward with making a new Silent Hill game, and it has to be Silent Hills. Like, it basically has to make that demo obsolete. It has to make that not a thing that's like the only way to experience a Hideo Kojima Silent Hill experience. And it has to be like good, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Cause even like, even if they make Silent Hills and they get Kojima and it sucks, people will still be like, Oh, but PT was a banger on its own. <laughs> like PT was already absolute heat. So it's like, that'll still be worth money, you know? Which for anybody right. who didn't get a chance to play PT and wants something similar to PT. Um, when I was talking about indie games, on the last Steam yep. Indie Games Fest, there was a game called uh, that they released a demo for called Hellseed Chapter One. And then, yeah, what I was going to say is I'll recommend if you if you played PT or if you like the look of PT and if you have any like positive feelings towards it, you want to see more like that uh, visage or visage, however you would say it, uh, is a horror game on Steam. I think it's like 30 bucks and it is very like self-admittedly directly inspired by PT is a full game. And it just uses a lot of the same horror uh, delivery methods, I'd say, that PT uses, where it's like a lot of atmospheric horror, similar story of like some kind of tragedy, family oriented tragedy occurred in this house that you're now in and you're trying to unravel it. But it works in like chapters and it's very like weird and experimental and like a lot of really cool transitions from room to room where like things will open and like lead into things that they absolutely should not. It's just a really cool game. And I remember playing that a little while back and I really enjoyed it. 
And so if you're if you're into that kind of thing, it's like very much like a love letter to the demo that came out very good and it's like a full game like level of content. So And you said that's Visage? Yeah, Visage. It's crazy how it's just a demo and it's one of the best games in the last ten years. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That was like it's it's like I said, it's it's also my objective second best horror game that exists. (laughs) Like it just speaks to how much how much creativity and design can bring to games still like and and elevate yeah. the genre yeah because like, it's just a hallway there's nothing really <laughs> exactly. to it. there's a hallway and like two <laughs> right. like rooms that you can go into and that's it yeah and it's just so well executed on like every single level as far as like visually sound design the actual concept itself the level of control that you have over everything and the level of immersion you get just from how it's designed like all of it it's just absolutely incredible yeah which actually, I think the one that I just recommended, Hellseed, is not the one that's the direct rip of PT. Um, but it's just another one that you guys should check out if you just ignore it. It takes place in like the 1980s or something. Cool. And it's kind of like a, if you mixed PT and Outlast and threw it into like a late 70s horror movie with that kind of like graininess. That. that sounds really cool. Yeah. No, my, um, despite how much I'm praising this very like cerebral, sort of atmospheric horror my absolute favorite like if i'm gonna put on a horror movie on a random night i'm putting on an 80s slasher movie oh yeah without question like a cheesy 80s slasher is always the absolute go-to so and plus i feel like it's it's always thought as weird that i find those types of things like comfort films because it's like you grew yeah. up with it it's no but fun. i'm the exact same you way you know it's not like <laughs> yeah it's not too serious like Okay. There's no stakes. Yeah, it's like, like yeah, Jason Voorhees just took a guy in half, or like he punched a guy's head off on the top of a roof, and Jason takes Manhattan. It's all fun. Yeah, that was really cool. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's especially like getting into the stuff of like practical effects or like makeup and things. It's gets more enjoyable over time. So you mm-hmm. you throw on a Disney movie, I'll throw on uh, Nightmare on Elm Street Three: Dream Warriors. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so that is pt which I, i'm glad i didn't bring it up at the top of the show i was going to and i figured it's a teaser it's not a full game we probably don't have it on the list so i wanted to get out of the way as everybody loves pt right like it's yeah. it's the top of the line for all of us <laughs> right now um so it was just gonna be like the the understood given choice number four for everybody on this list so i'm glad you yeah. brought it up there yeah i forgot about it <laughs> That's fair. I mean, if you're not like, if you're not doing horror stuff, it's not going to be present in your mind. And even if you are, it's probably not, you know, it's just, I have a problem, you see. (laughs) I mean, like, it's like, I forgot about it, but it was like, because that's exactly what it was, you know, played it once, you know, that one night at Deeds, we played the hell out of it for like four or five hours. And then I hadn't played it since, but it had a very long lasting impact. Yeah. And since you don't have access to it, it's not something that, I creeps just up play. over time yeah yep. so it was just like yep it's frozen in amber trapped in the moment back there i watched um there's a couple there's a youtube channel i like watching and they were they have a bunch of like single one-off games that they'll play because it's not enough to develop content on but they still want to play it and pt was one of the episodes and i must have watched this like maybe a month or two ago and watching mm-hmm. them relive that experience i had that night was like kind of terrifying because there were a couple points where I'm like, I know what's about to happen. Please don't. And seeing their reaction of like freaking out is equally hilarious. But like, I have that like my gut twisted feeling because I know like I've been there. I know what they're currently feeling right now. Good times. I think I watched uh, watched a lot of that game through my fingers when uh, you guys were playing it. <laughs> so, PT, which brings us to Nick. What is your number two? I've alluded to it so far, coming up to my number two choice. Um, This is also a, I'm a classic gamer, but actually a lot of the games that have come out in the last, I'd say, five, ten years for the more recent consoles like Xbox One, those have actually been shining examples of like, wow, these are actually like they've come so far since I actually feel they're scarier now than when I was growing up playing them. But this one... I'm a huge fan of the franchise as it was, and this is the only instance where I think they actually hit it out of the park, and that's Alien Isolation. Rated M for Mature. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm stranded here on this station. There's something 
stalking us. It finds us wherever we hide. And now it's hunting me. Alien isolation out now. Yep. I thought that yeah. had to be one of yours. <laughs> that makes sense. That's it's like Aliens, the sequel to the one in the, the 70s. That one has spawned so many different like fucking video games and homages to it. Like Halo is a complete ripoff of Aliens, like not in terms yeah. of story, but thematically like the Colonial Marines with the um, what are they called in Halo? Oh, the U uh, USMC. Yeah, like that. The same exact even like the sergeant is exactly copying from aliens yeah. oh, and they yeah. have they have never made a good aliens game you would think something as simple as just like just recreate it like just recreate aliens but in a video game and they still can't do it yeah the closest we've gotten is uh rebellions alien vs predator game from like 2009 i want to yep. say it's like it's decent it was fun yep. and then this they decided you know what screw all that shit let's go back to its core and they revisited the first alien where it's just one and you have to hide from it. Meanwhile, you still have to progress through the whole game trying to like get back to, I think, it's very similar to Dead Space where you're trapped on a destroyed ship and you have to escape. And you're trying to, you know, salvage what you can to find all the tools that you can to like call for help and, you know, find an escape pod to leave the thing. Meanwhile, as you're doing all of this you realize there is something loose on the station and you find out in the, one of the first cutscenes, like it's an alien and now it's hunting you and you have to avoid not only the stations like malfunctioning robots, but you now have a migrating xenomorph that's trying to kill you every opportunity that it has. And this was another one of those um, games where it took the audio from like the Xbox's thing that would go over the TV with the mic. Oh, the what the connect. Yeah. It would actually listen in, and depending on if you were loud or if it would detect noises, it would take that input and have the alien respond to it. So if you're really loud <laughs> while you're trying to hide and the alien is nearby, if it hears you, it'll actually come over and investigate, which I thought was cool. That aspect of just taking the survival horde and instead of you being the one with the gun, you know, clearing out rooms of the undead or like all these different alien creatures that in this case it's like no you just have to survive they actually took the survival horror aspect to heart and it was probably one of the not even just being an alien game i feel like just the game in itself it's one of those instances where like yes you took an ip of a already well-known established ip but you just made a really good fucking game on top of that yeah like they can just take the xenomorph out of it and just throw in whatever their monster or thing was, and yep. the game would still hold. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no, honestly, like, the only criticism I have of Alien Isolation is it's, like, a bit too long, which is very common. Yeah. I know a lot of people say that. It's just, like, it's, like, just a bit too long. But it's great. Which the Alien Isolation, I really dug watching you play it. But it's not something that I loved to play, and I think it's mainly because I hate games where there's an unkillable opponent, where it's like, well, I get weapons. Yeah, but the weapons don't work on it. But I have, like, a gun, and I have, like, a flamethrower, and I have this, and it's like, yeah, but none of it works. And I would rather just have all of that taken from me entirely to not even give me the illusion of having a fight against it. Yeah. In the beginning of the game, you definitely are afraid of it, without question. Oh, yeah. And then toward the end, even though you can't kill it, you just scare it away. And it did that fear kind of left you toward the last, yeah. like, I'd say maybe hour or two of the game. Once you've established, like, you're no longer just like some scrub that got lost on the space station. It's like you're now one of the predators on there, basically. So you're walking around <laughs> with your flamethrower and you just have like a 50 percent of your tank reserved for when that fucker decides to show up. You just blast him in the face <laughs> and then you're all set. You can just keep on going. You're not even trying to hide anymore at that point. Yeah. The only time I played that was at your guys' house and I you know couldn't stay all night or couldn't stay and play all of it, but I ju I got just far enough to be terrified just like the first or second time. Well, there's the first time I think he like he spears somebody with his tail, but then the second time when you actually see it like in that control room like you're hiding behind the computer. I was like this is about all I can uh, handle and that that's that's good enough. For <laughs> I remember me. that night. I didn't actually know you were uh uneasy about horror games. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm a big scaredy cat. 
You're just like, that's enough for me, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm playing the game, like, I know the alien's coming. Like, when's the alien coming? Like, so, you know, I'm go, I go slow. I'm very meth- meticulous through these games because I'm like, where's the scare going to be? Mm-hmm. Just that whole first part where there's no alien danger. It's just those, the people on board. But yeah. Yeah, it, it's scared me. They should make a mod where they remove the xenomorph from alien isolation. So then it's just the the dread of where is it? And then like three hours and you're like, I don't think there's an alien on this ship. <laughs> <laughs> and then he just shows up at like the very end of the yeah. <laughs> like, Where were you? Oh, I was in isolation. It's like yeah. one booth. He's in the back, just like looking out through the glass. <laughs> it's like I was in isolation and the credits roll. <laughs> like, that's it. We're done. No, I, uh, I do actually. Something you mentioned before, Tim, where you're saying like the whole thing with the guns where like you'd rather just not have them. I think in general, I'm glad that horror games, another change that's kind of come about recently where there was a big trend for a while where every horror game was a game where you just couldn't do anything about the monsters. It was like, oh, well, it's here. You better run. Like, that was about it. It was all hiding and and running away. And like, you know, it was kind of like those amnesia outlast type games, which is fine in moderation. But it was really a bummer when that was like all you had for horror games for a while. And I've always been much more of like, I like the horror intention that comes from, lo and behold, a survival horror type game where it's like the whole point is, okay, you need to manage your, your, uh, your ammo and, and your healing supplies and stuff like that. And the tension that comes from like, knowing how to approach an encounter as opposed to just, oh, an encounter has happened and I must escape. Yeah. I think that having the option to stand and deliver and like hold your ground and fight back and needing to on the fly judge whether this situation is one of those situations or not, or whether it's one that you need to disengage. I love that so much more for horror games. I think that's just, it it gives so much more player agency and it makes it feel like it makes it feel scary because it's like, you could make a wrong call, you know, when, when you're presented with a monster and your one option is to just get out of there, it's like, okay, cool. I know what's happening. I don't, I don't have that panic in my mind of like, what do I do? What do I do? It's just like, uh, okay, there's the door I'm going. Yeah. You know, which I think like I dig that. I think my thing is not so much that I would rather not have the weapons at all. It's a case of they present you with a creature that I know from watching like the movies and the lore and whatnot. Yeah, if I yeah. hit it with a flamethrower, or I shoot it in the head with a pistol, it dies and everything else. Why is it here that it doesn't? If they were to take that out and put in a different creature that's like, oh, this is a different xenomorph that regenerates over time or something like that, then I would see, okay, like I could deal with that. So give me my weapons. I'll fend it off, but at least I understand, like, okay, that's why it's not dying from getting blasted. Yeah. Because it was even, wasn't wasn't it like an adolescent xenomorph? I don't remember. It, I've only played it through yeah. once. Like, from start to finish once. Yeah. They should take that exact idea for a game, and then just take the creeper from Jeepers Creepers, who regenerates over time, expand it from a ship to, like, small town, uh, arkansas or whatever it took place in Man, well i haven't watched jeepers creepers in so long they kind of they kind of did that with resident evil 3 the remake and i actually didn't yeah. like that because every time the nemesis would pop up you have the option to run but the fucker does not stop chasing you and the only option to really escape is to like start combat with him because he mm-hmm. follows you into save like safe spots and that's the scariest part about it so when you're trying to escape, you know, he'll approach you sometimes at the most inopportune times. Like, you know, with Resident Evil, since the new remakes are calling back to like ammo management and inventory management where you're not just given mm-hmm. like a backpack that's like um, it's the D&D thing. The um, oh, bag of, bag of yeah, holding. Yeah, it's not a bag of holding where you could fit like a rocket launcher, a Jeep, a Mack truck and like a hundred <laughs> other things in your backpack. It's like and bag just and pull <laughs> Yeah. Um, in this case, it's like you have your you can all you got like five guns, but you only have the inventory to carry like two plus ammo plus space for other stuff to pick up. So you'll be going between back and forth your objective and you'll get to that point where like the nemesis will pop out and all you've got is your pistol. It's like, well, shit, I don't want to waste all of my pistol ammo on this thing when it's not going to really do much. So you run and grab your shotgun and then you realize, like, I only have like five shells left and you were trying to save it for something else. Whereas this is just a passing encounter, which kind of sucks. Yeah, the um, actually, so 
So the funny thing is the uh, the him following people into save rooms was a bug in an early build of the game. Uh, okay, because I was gonna say I'm and like that sounds yeah crazy. <laughs> it got patched out, but there was actually a huge amount of fans, myself included, that were like, "Please make that a functionality on like a harder difficulty." Yeah, make it like the hardest difficulty. Like make safe rooms not matter to Nemesis. That'd be awesome. Like, like I would love that just as an. Option. I don't <laughs> like. I won't bring the another game up just yet, just in case it's on anybody's list. But there was another one where it's like you have safety in the save room, and I would cheese it of like start a fight, and then I would take three steps back, and the guy would be like, "Save room can't enter." And I'm like, eh, that's "Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Later, buddy." Yeah. So yeah, that that was that's solid. So Alien Isolation, that's Nick's number two. Which, yeah, all bangers so far. Really good picks number on everyone's two. part. <laughs> Did Echo the Dolphin have a sequel? They made another Echo the Dolphin called like Defender of the Ocean. I don't know. It, it's I think it's like an actual like three D. It's not a Sega sequel. Mm-hmm. Um, and if there if it is if it does exist, I would not have played it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so my second game will probably just spark more discussion among you guys because I won't have much to say about it, but. I know we all you all walked the beat of Blockbuster back in the days. I guess what, what did we have back then? Magazines. There was maybe the internet a little bit in like mm-hmm. ninety five, six, seven, that kind of stuff. Dial up. But um, <laughs> all you could do is look at the back and like read about the game. Be like, do I want to try this? Do I want to rent this? Or if it's a sequel, you know, kind of what I mean, you're getting. It's the same thing with VHS horror movies back in the yeah, day. Yeah, it's exactly. You Grab them with that cover art. <laughs> Talking to you, Chopping Mall. Chopping Mall. Where shopping costs you an arm and a leg. <laughs> <laughs> I always walked by Resident Evil, and I'm like, what is that? Bizarre murder cases have recently occurred in Raccoon City. There are outlandish reports of families being attacked by a group of about 10 people. Victims were apparently eaten. Bravo team went to the hideout of the group and disappeared. Look, Chris! Resident Evil. Just a guy on the cover just holding a gun. I guess it's just, he's just shooting? It's a shooter? So I finally rented it one night. And it was back, Blockbuster was like six or seven day rentals, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I popped the game in. I don't know why, from the the opening FMV of Resident Evil One, that I didn't realize what I was getting into, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I did, but I'm just like, maybe I can do this because I mean, the, the it's just a, a it's a slasher horror movie essentially to be for the the opening sequence. It's like a movie. Yeah. It's like an actual movie. It's filmed. It's oh yeah, a, it's the coolest thing footage. in the world. Yeah. Um, it's very American Werewolf in London, or like kind of, except, no werewolf. I guess, to the extreme. Weird dogs, right? There were weird yeah. dogs. Had to wait 20 years for the werewolves. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you get that crazy, bloody opening horror sequence. Um, they make it to the mansion. That, it's funny that that intro, <laughs> like... And then they have like the introduce the characters is like very cheesy compared to like this yeah. like just terrible horror. Oh, thing dude, that's like happens. listed as one of the worst voice acting and scripted lines <laughs> of all time. Jill, the master of lockpicks, would have great use for this lockpick. Or I, I don't remember the full thing. Yeah, the master of unlocking. Yeah, it's an achievement in practically every Resident Evil game now. <laughs> Jill, here's a lockpick. It might be handy if you, the master of unlocking, take it with you. Wesker's hair. That's all I remember from yeah. that sequence. FMV is a lost art, man. <laughs> <laughs> Albert Wesker. But you get to the mansion and it's like it's just silent. The talk, the clock is ticking. Literally, you just hear that grandfather clock and uh, you know the exposition, yada yada. We're gonna explore this place, and then you go. I, f- I forget what prompts you to just go down the one hall, and you. About to go around that corner, then I think it cuts to an FMB, and it's just like you see the zombie, the first zombie, just like eating that dude, and it just like slowly just like turns its head and just looks at you, and then gets up and comes after you, and it's I a just head like, nod. <laughs> not his though. <laughs> He's like, yes, 
I saw that zombie coming for me. I just stood up, I pushed the power button, and I wasted my six-day rental. <laughs> like, no, no, I'm good. I got my fill. Do you know the exact thing happened with me with aliens? Same exact thing. I just like, shit, the six-day rental is like, ugh. Slam it back on the counter. You gave this to trash to, my to mom. a child, sir. I think I, had, I think I had to lie to my mom that I played that game. Um, but... Yeah, that was terrifying for me. That was just like it's just a memorable, terrifying thing. And of course, I've gone back and watched. I mean, I could probably play that game now because there's um there is a when you when you get older and the graphics are oh it's kind of like cheesy graphics. It's something I think you can handle maybe a little bit more. But yeah, it was terrifying at the time, mm-hmm. and it probably still is scary to a degree. But I've gone back and watched like. Th- through the game and it's like an excellent game and then i never saw that neptune sequence though until like i was researching the sharks in games <laughs> yeah that would have been i don't know where that comes in the game do you know how far is it like towards the end or like the middle it's yeah it's like definitely like the last third of the game god so i never I would have seen it anyway it's, it's actually yeah. as um, soon as you see it eating the helicopter pilot you turn around to run away and there's just a room with a shark a shark right there <laughs> oh, i mean god. Hey, if, if you do resident evil randomizers this is a very real chance of that, that happening <laughs> Sort of like a Nuzlocke Resident Evil. <laughs> yeah, so there's actually there is a mod build of Resident Evil One Remake for the, like the, like the GameCube edition of the game. Uh, I think you run it through Dolphin, but basically it randomizes the doors. What they connect to will remain consistent once they're established, but like the doors connect to random doors. Oh, that's so cool. like mm. what would have been the dining room is now like the backyard. It usually leads to it's like it's more fun as like an experiment and like a challenge of like because it can soft lock you very easily or hard lock you because it can just be like, oh, I don't have the room like the rooms that I have aren't giving me the keys. Like, you know, like Um, it can also be like the first door you open is the final boss fight like that happens. So it's more fun to just kind of like dick around with and it's like fun to mess around. And it's it's a good time. I've, I've played it like once or twice and it was it was cool. I know people hold Resident Evil 2 as like very, in very high regard in the series. Like, but did you guys like when you played the first one? Was that like a, a great experience for you guys, horror wise? Yes. Um, I actually didn't play the first one first. I played the second one first, and then when I got the first one, I got up to like the portrait painting puzzle, and I just had no fucking mm-hmm. clue how to get past it, and it just yeah. sat on my you know, on my game shelf for years until I got like the strategy guide. I'm like, Oh, that's how you do it. And then thanks Prima. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and then I was able to beat it. And then I was, you know, I, I finished it, but I only played it through that one time. Resident evil two. However, like that one, I was like completing on like S rank and I played the absolute hell out of it. Yeah. I looking back, I prefer two to one, but I played one first and I love them both. Like, I love them both dearly, but I definitely just prefer, like, Leon's been my boy for as long as I can remember. Hell yeah. <laughs> I remember the first time I played it, too, I died instantly because I didn't know how to raise my gun and fire. I didn't know about, like, the <laughs> tank controls. Yep. Yeah, did, how, how long did that control scheme, like, last in the series? Like, with would, would you, like, hold X to actually walk, right? It was, it was very uh, different than anything I'd played. You hold X to point. run, and then yeah. L1 to aim, and then R1 to fire, or, you know, L2. But you R2. wouldn't move with, like... The directional pad didn't allow you to move. You'd three, point yourself. You'd, you'd turn with left right. and right, and then you would either hold forward or X, depending on how fast you wanted gotcha. to go. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, that, but yeah, that kind of threw me off. But yeah, that control scheme lasted up until Code Veronica X. I think was the last game that used tank controls, yep. like in in that way. Like they were already cleaning up by then, but uh, that was like the last game. Because then, like, it depends on where you consider four to be as because four is still technically tank controls. It's still like you turn and move with the same uh, stick. It just doesn't so, have like, the static you camera. Play, yeah, you don't you don't strafe with left and right in four. You rotate and then you just hit forward and backward. So, which it's amazing how our brains are able to accept these control schemes because it's like we were talking about Goldeneye being great at goldeneye and then going back years later and being like i cannot possibly use this nintendo 64 controller or back in the day playing turok 2 and having to like (laughs) aim with my left hand center analog and then moving with my (laughs) right hand c buttons and playing that on multiplayer now just blows my mind i don't know like i actually i can adapt to the tank controls pretty easy i never had a problem with it i can see the complaint 
And a lot of people are like, I don't like that. You can only do one or the other. You can't shoot and run. It's either one. But I actually kind of liked it. And I always felt like it was just a, you know, part of the experience. Yeah. I never had trouble with tank controls, but I was never sure if that was just because I grew up playing them or yeah. if it was like, uh, like they're not as bad. Because like yeah. I, I did. I, I played them a ton when I was a kid. So like I was never sure if it was just, oh, I'm used to this or like it's not that bad, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Which I, I know I'm among friends here, so I'll let you guys in on a secret. I've never <laughs> played the first three Resident Evil games, whether the originals or the remakes of those three. Shame Remake on you. Two, and I'm not especially. a horror fan. <laughs> play i'd say like dude like that's cool i get it play remake 2 yeah i'd say just yeah. like just like play remake 2 it's tough like as someone who like it's literally my favorite video game series i find it very hard to recommend people now who never played them go back and play one two three just because it's so obtuse like i yeah. love them as someone who played them and i think that they are very valid games but like i get that the industry has changed since then like if you were to tell someone like, oh, you want to get into shooters? You wouldn't tell them now to go play Goldeneye, like you just said, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, that would be, like, maybe once you're used to it a bit more and, like, you play some more modern examples, then you can go try it. But So how wouldn't... would you compare it to something like, say, Resident Evil 6 or 5? Six is, yeah, I was going to say, 6 Chris is a tough one. punches <laughs> a boulder in half. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. Resident Evil games are much like how I imagine a child, a parent is with their children. Where I or love Fast them all and the dearly. Furious as a series. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I love them all dearly, just for different reasons. Um, <laughs> except Umbrella Core. Umbrella Core is like the one that I can't excuse. But 5 and 6 are like... The issue with 5 and 6 is the pace. It's, it's the pace and the tone, it being more action-based and not being as much of like a horror experience anymore, or like not a horror experience anymore. I appreciate yeah. that they tried. It's yeah. It's, it's like, like if the rest of them were alien, five and six are aliens. Yeah, it's exactly like one's a horror movie, one's an action uh, more movie. Like, you know? More like AVP. You... <laughs> yeah. Even then, like aliens did have the much more like colonial marine focus, at least. So like you kind of yeah. brought in like, a, oh, we're bug hunting. Like, <laughs> let's yeah. go. But yeah, no, like six especially is like, they're still fun. They're just not what people like about or liked about Resident Evil. Because, you know, yeah. like there's I feel like. It may not be as much of a thing now. I, I kind of see it every now and then on Twitter and stuff. But, like, I feel like eventually there will come a point where it's, like, you know how people kind of came around where, like, it got, it became okay to say that you liked Revenge of the Sith? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Where, like, people, like, used to really shit on Revenge I'm of the really, Sith and that eventually I'm it was just, really like, I'm uh, really glad that, that you're right. Because it's, like, I always enjoyed it. I was the target audience when Lucas exactly. made the prequels. And I get the hate for the prequels and i like i don't even dare talk about the sequels in an open forum anymore mm -hmm. because it's just there's it's so it's just unwise it's, <laughs> it's so toxic that like no matter what i say i'm either bashing women or i'm bashing some kind of race or i like yeah. no matter what it just doesn't work and like i don't even want to do that i can't and the prequels are yeah. finally getting the love that they deserve and exactly and that's that's where I feel like we're going to end up with five and six is like, eventually it won't be this like dirty thing to say that you liked Resident Evil five. Cause it's like, you like them just for different reasons. I like star Wars revenge of the Sith for different reasons than I like star Wars, the empire strikes back, you know? Like, yeah. And it's just one of those things where it's like, I think five and six are very valid games that are well-made and fun. They're just not the core Resident Evil experience. And I'm very happy that, they're moving back towards that core experience of focusing on like the tension and the horror and the, the resource management and such. Because the thing is one thing that always gets me is people will shit on games like, um, like operation raccoon city, right? Which is an offshoot in the series. Basically you play as an umbrella controlled cleanup team going into raccoon city during the events of two and three to basically act as a cleanup crew. And you're like, you're kind of like uh black bagging all like the witnesses and stuff like that. It's a cool game. You get to play as the villains. It's, you know, it's it's very much like an action shooter. And it had some issues, like, design-wise, but the thing is, people always shit on it because they're like, oh, it's an action game. And my take has always been, since it came out, is like, who cares? It's a side game. Yeah. It's not yeah. main series, you know? Like, it's you should be free to branch off into different genres, especially in side games. That's the whole point. I get it why it's more of a problem, obviously, based on the argument I'm presenting, when it's a main game. Where, like, oh, cool. Like, you, you get one Resident Evil every, like, two to four years, say, right? And, cool, we got our Resident Evil. It's an action game. It's not horror at all. That's our mainline game. We have to wait, like, 
four more years to get another one, you know? Yeah. So I get that. And I'm glad that main series is back to horror, because I think that's how it should be. But if they want to give me, like, stupid side games where, like, man... All right, so people were talking about Joe Baker today, the uh, which was that he was the protagonist of the End of Zoe DLC from Resident Evil 7. And I don't know if you guys have seen that, but it's pretty much the coolest thing that that game offers, because mm-hmm. Joe Baker is an ex-Marine that lives in a swamp and punches gators to death. <laughs> and the entire DLC is just you play as Joe Baker, who finds out that his niece Zoe has been crystallized by um, Evelyn after the events of Seven. In order to save her, he has to go get the serum. And there's a bunch of molded between him and the serum, and you don't get guns. You get your fists. <laughs> And it's just a first-person brawler where you punch these monsters to death. And that was a very welcome and fun and goofy addition to the ending of the very, like, serious and grounded seven. It was like, you know, it came after. It was a fun little epilogue. Yeah. And I want them to make a game based on that system so bad. Like, yeah. <laughs> the, I actually just tweeted it today. Like, people were talking about, like, it was just a Joe Baker appreciation thread. And I was like, please, we're getting mercenaries with eight. Please make Joe Baker a mercenaries character. <laughs> Because, like, the whole thing with mercenaries is they're different characters with different loadouts. Put Joe in and have your loadout just be your fists. Slappers yeah. only. I would love that so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... I still will always remember playing through 5 and 6. I played it through with, um... Actually, with our, our friend David, who was on the, the Fighting Game episode with Sam. Oh, where cool. our goal was only make it through the game with, like, suplexes and kicks. Yeah. <laughs> and just that, like the BSAA that Chris worked for, we referred to as the big, strong American army. And it was just only <laughs> suplexes. If I could punch that's it, really that's good. it. No guns. Game over. Yeah. So it's, oh, awesome. they'll always hold a spot in my heart. But yeah, I agree. It's even as somebody who didn't come in at the beginning of the series, I came in at four and that kind of brought me into the fold on it. I was excited for seven. I loved the idea of seven. I'm excited for eight by the time this episode drops um, because we're staggered. We'll probably be about a month out from the game already dropping from there. So everybody will either know they love it or know they hate it. Mm -hmm. But it's I think overall, it's all moving in the right direction. I agree. Yeah, they've really put it on a a great course for the series. Capcom in general, like just as a games industry analysis thing is like, Capcom's been doing so good, man. They brought back Resident Evil in, like... I, not even Resident They brought back Resident Evil true to form. They brought back DMC true to form. Monster Hunter is yeah. on the hell of a roll right now, reaching a wider, like, a global audience now after being, like, basically just a Japan game. It was in America, but, like, how many people could you go into... We talked about it before. No one played, like, these games that we played. So, like, you couldn't talk to anyone about Monster Hunter, and now, like, yeah. now so it's many on the people rise. are playing it. Yeah, it's everywhere. So they've just been Capcom has been on a hell of a run recently. I want them to do more with Mega Man, but that's about it. Yeah, I would love to see a, a rekindling of Mega Man making a comeback. Yeah, Eleven was great. Eleven was really good. I think that'll be tough. I would be willing for them to do something like what they did with Resident Evil. Obviously, not like a like a parallel change of like you know have Mega Man start in like this Texas Chainsaw Massacre kind of style like intro. <laughs> but, um, you know, it just seven is so radically different from the rest of the series that it was a good starting off point of like, let's start fresh. And the whole time I'm playing it, I remember too like this. This isn't Resident Evil to me. It's fun as hell, but like it's not Resident Evil to me until like the last, I think, 10 minutes of the game where like the final puzzle piece fits in and everything clicks like, holy shit. OK, this is fucking cool. Yeah. And now I can understand how this ties in with the rest of the franchise. And they did everything right. And I'm really hoping eight does that. And um, I think Mega Man needs that kind of reboot in the same vein that Resident Evil had. Well, now I'm kind of interested in you saying Mega Man and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> if he defeats the Leatherface boss, he then gets the the chainsaw hand. That'd be cool as hell, man. <laughs> you got to kill I'm Hannibal Lecter first to get the leather face. So you can take him on and it just confuses him because you're wearing a leather face too. Yeah. And then it slowly just turns into a Splatterhouse remake. Oh, sick, man. That'd be so cool. <laughs> Splatterhouse <laughs> Origins. My big thing with Mega Man is like getting into the the Proto Men in in like early college for me, which is like they're like this big '80s esque rock opera yeah. based on Mega Man, and it's like a retelling of the story that's very stylized, 
but it's cool as shit, man. And I'd love to see like a different take on the series. Like, obviously, I, I doubt they'd do anything like that with it. But it'd be so cool to just see that like that tone shift of like even just like a slightly older audience, just like a T-rated Mega Man, you know? Yeah. Or just bring back Legends. I'm a simple man. <laughs> like, yeah. Although actually, right now, because they did Detective Pikachu and they did the Sonic movie, I feel like they're ripe to do a a Mega Man movie in the same vein, and then just slowly work towards a Smash Brothers Avengers style team up. Man, do it already. So cool. <laughs> Sonic was way better than it had any right to be. Yeah, in my was. opinion. Well, that, that's so what they had on the two. poster. <laughs> Sonic has it's better than it has any right to be. I like. I really yeah. enjoyed Sonic when I watched it. Like a lot yeah. of that was Jim Carrey, but like I had a yes. lot of fun. Yeah, Ben. Um, Ben. Oh, from Schwartz. Parks and Rec. Yeah, Ben, yeah, Schwartz, ben Schwartz was great. Yeah, but Jim, Car- I, I thought Jim, I thought I would be rolling my eyes at Jim Carrey. Instead, I was like, I think we need more Jim Carrey. He, he yeah, was like, I'm really excited to be like, he was like an old friend that you hadn't seen in ages. <laughs> yeah, it felt like an old Jim Carrey movie. Like, I'm really excited to just see him come back and be like full on Robotnik. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that last scene with him, you know. <laughs> so that was Resident Evil. You did a really good job. This case was just too weird. This case was... (laughs) Yeah, you're welcome. Tim, what is your number (laughs) two slot? It was a horror movie. Uh, This one you know, Nick. So this is a game from August of 2015 on PS4. We had a a very... We've had a, a series of nights that we coined specifically around this game so let me by saying it one of my favorite gaming memories is getting this game making a weekend out of it where nick and i in our first apartment when we moved in together we would get food we would get snacks we'll settle in at like sunset we'll start playing this game and we'll wrap it up just as the sun's coming up and we (laughs) called it until dawn until dawn imagine a night this was the right thing to do. Where every single action it's definitely creepy down here affects your fate and the fate of those around you. We need to go get help now. <laughs> Could you live with the consequences? <laughs> Only your choices determine who will survive until dawn. Exclusively on PS4 for the players. <laughs> So, Until Dawn is an interactive horror game where you kind of hop around playing as a bunch of friends um, up at this cabin in the woods because, of course, as somebody begins trying to bump them off at first, so the whole setup is they're getting together for the first time after a prank goes wrong about a year before and two of their friends die with no bodies being ever, uh, ever being found. So, it cuts between kind of Third-person exploration is you check out Blackwood Mountain and you try to figure out what's going on and eventually trying to survive until dawn when you can get help. And then it goes from there and there's kind of quick time events for these uh, cutscenes where you have to quickly act on it because one of the big draws of the game is the story uses a butterfly effect system that changes based on actions, responses, or how well you perform the quick time events. So any character can die at any point or, well, any character can die at any point where there's like a, a these triggering quick time events and certain yeah. responses. And then the story will be drastically changed from that point out. And it might be a case of you end up having a character during your playthrough that died in the beginning. And now the rest of the game, you don't have that character. The rest of the interactions change. The ending might have differences, things of that sort, where somebody else might play through. They kept them alive, but somebody else might have died or they kept them all alive to the end. It's a system that they later used, um, Supermassive Games, in their Dark Pictures Anthology series, Man of Madon, Little Hope, upcoming uh, House of Ashes, which was very cool. And it was intercut with scenes of Peter Stormare, always a a fun one to have, playing a psychologist Mm. who, in between kind of these parts of the game, it'll cut back to him as he's speaking to you and just kind of going through and analyzing choices that were made and characters and cryptic info and whatnot but overall like the, it still holds a spot for me over the dark pictures anthology as kind of my favorite but overall i'm just a, a sucker for the interactive horror did you play the newest one uh, um the little hope yeah i started to but it was a case like this where 
these days, my schedule, I only have time to sit down for like an hour, hour and a half at a time. And I want to just take a weekend and just like start it late Friday night and just blow into it into the morning. Um, just because I feel like we did Man of Madon in parts. Yeah. And I think it hurt it for it because it's you're starting into a story, you're getting involved, and then you drop it. Then you pick it back up, you're trying to remember where you are, and then you drop it. And it kind of detracts from your involvement a bit. Until Dawn was fantastic, and it brought back memories of playing, like, Heavy Rain, and some of the, even the Telltale games, too, um, whenever they hit it right. Because they they made, like, several Telltale games, but not all of them are good. Um, But the ones that they did do well were amazing. And until dawn was just like, you know, that it there are not many times where you feel like you're playing a next gen game. And this felt like that on all aspects. It looked amazing. The gameplay mechanics were really unique and different, even though it's something I have already done before. That butterfly effect thing was fucking cool. You know, picking up all those totems every time you do, it's like you never know what you're going to. It's like box of chocolates moment, but it's always going to freak you out because it's never something good. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um Until Dawn was fucking amazing, but Man of Madon, I I did not enjoy it as much. I felt like it was so much shorter in comparison to Until Dawn. It is. It's a lot shorter. But when yeah. I saw what you say, Little Hope? Yeah. That one I heard better things about, but just so much time has passed that um a lot of the steam behind it is just kind of lost, so it's Yeah, cuz it- at this point, the third one is coming out at, I'm assuming, in the next like four months. It's supposed to be 2021, but that's House of Ashes. Yeah, they usually ship around September, October for understandable reasons. Yeah. I felt the same way with... So I, I like Until Dawn a lot. I think I've played through it a total of four or five times with different groups of people. Like, yeah. everyone taking a character and it's stuff It's the like ultimate that. game of, like, what are we doing on a Friday? Have you ever played this? I just want to yeah. watch you play this. Yeah, exactly. And like we usually do the thing where it's like, you know, I have we'll have a group of like I think I have a group of like eight or nine people and we'll like each take a character and, oh, and play cool. their segments and stuff. That's always fun. So that's actually why I haven't played uh Little Hope yet, because I played until dawn with them like that, and then we did Madame Madon like that, but with quarantine we haven't been able to do that yep. for Little Hope. So that's one of the first things we're doing when we all get back together. Actually, we've been talking about it actually it's funny you bring this game up because we I actually just got a text about that like yesterday. They were like, we're still doing Little Hope when we get back together, right? So yeah. I'm looking forward to that a lot. I think the funniest thing about Until Dawn is that we're supposed to believe they're all high schoolers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man, clearly he's at least like 16. Yeah. <laughs> like Peter Stormare is there too. Yeah. No, What's I remember up, like, <laughs> Hey, did you do your math homework? <laughs> no kids. <laughs> I remember at some point one of the characters like um it, it might have been Hayden Panettiere's character she's like oh if I don't do this I'm grounded and I'm like bro you're 27 what do you mean you're grounded <laughs> if you're grounded it's self inflicted <laughs> yeah yeah it's our um I think this was the first thing I actually saw Rami Malek in yep so yeah. everybody knows him from like oh the Bohemian Mr. Rhapsody Robo. and Mr. Robot and I think of him as like oh yeah he's at the Until Dawn guy yeah he was that yeah. oh yeah asshole night, that killed night at everyone. the museum yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah he played King Tut right yeah. yeah yeah he was King Tut you know it's like the uh, the Academy Award nominee guy from Until Dawn gets chopped in half yeah no oh, that's well. uh yeah you know yeah you know <laughs> it's it's a cool game. Did you bring up the uh, the animal aspect? Like, remember Lara shooting the squirrel? <laughs> it's a good yeah, judge of character. Yeah, or when you have a snowball fight and you could hit a bird with it. On like <laughs> when you give the controller to someone and you've rewatched this game like four or five times already, but knowing like the choices the player is about to make, you can kind of gauge on like their it's like a personality test. I feel like I should have a lab coat and glasses and be like writing down on a, a scratch pad. <laughs> You're giving a yeah, rock and you see a bird in the distance and it's close enough that you probably could hit it if you threw the rock. Do you? Like that's uh it's like the beginning of Blade Runner when they're doing the test on the... Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> you see a tortoise in the desert, and it's on its back. Do you help it? <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is... This is the one I, I definitely agree with, like, um, Little Hope of as soon as 
quarantine's done and everything's kind of getting back to normal and we're all kind of uh, getting back into things, I want to take a weekend and get the gang together for Man of Madon, just because that's also been our tradition for the most part too i've been wanting to mm-hmm. play it but again like it is better as a group and i'm nervous about playing it because i really didn't like the second one we ended up like th- trashing it with the amount of like poor things that like gameplay wise it gave you like because i don't know like it reminded me of like ghost ship but worse because it doesn't <laughs> have the hundred person decapitation in the first five minutes or mud vein uh, or <laughs> you know the the big two that drove films through the 2000s. Ghost Ship and Mud Vane. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like Ghost everything that like... would be etched on the front of my Trapper Keeper. <laughs> 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 but I almost kind of want to give Man of Madon a second shot, but play it all in one sitting, because I don't know if it lost some steam because I played it in parts. Because granted, it's short. It's not I know, until dawn. I know but... the ending we got several times was the bad one anyway. Because oh, yeah, was... I got to the end. And it was so short that I was like, oh, and then what happens? And then the credits, I'm like, oh, <laughs> OK. Is, uh, that the one on the sh- is this the sh- that's the one on the ship? Yeah. 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 OK. Yeah. Man of Madonna is like, it's not terrible. It's just nowhere near as good as Until Dawn. Yeah. Yeah. And it's maybe the, I think that it could be a pacing thing from like playing it in bursts. I could see how that could really affect it. Yeah. Because when we did it, we just bombed through it, like you said, like in a night. Yeah. Which also I know, like, it's 30 bucks compared to 60, but... Yeah. Hey, I would pay another 30 bucks to have 30 more dollars worth of game. Exactly. You know, Please. It, give give me more interactive horror games. It could be the, 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 the location, too. Because having a game set in the middle of the woods while it's snowing and just like the whole like location I feel is a lot more appealing than just being stuck on a ghost ship. Literally yeah. a haunted ghost ship. I mean, <laughs> for Dean, the probably the scariest part is the beginning when you go diving and there's the shark. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> Won't be holding the controller for that. <laughs> Clenching intensifies. There's always a damn shark. <laughs> That was the, originally the the last line of Jaws before they're like, punch it up. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that is until dawn, and I will be uh, religiously following anything else they churn out. Because even though I didn't love Man of Madon compared to Until Dawn, I still did like Man of Madon. So yeah, good stuff. Also interesting, the score for Until Dawn was Jason Graves, who did the score also for Dead Space. So. Really? That's six cool. degrees in there. It was just a prank, Han. So that brings us to our number ones. Josh. Yeah, so again, this is uh this is shared. Uh, in my opinion, this is like for me, I think it's the best it's my personal best horror game, absolutely. And I think that I, I put it as my objective one, because like even I think it holds up, and a lot of people do. It's also just as soon as I say this, you're going to know what it is, but it's incredibly influential and incredibly important in the history of video games as a whole, not just horror games. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw Resident Evil 4 out there. Forget everything you think you know about Resident Evil. I'm under the president's order to rescue you. My father? Oh my God, what's going on? Don't worry, Ashley. I'm coming for you. I am for the trust. Evil has evolved. Resident Evil 4 for Nintendo GameCube. Rated M for Mature. Only from Capcom. It's such an easy choice. It's such an obvious choice. I totally get it. But, like, man, if it isn't just one of my favorite games ever. Like, Resident Evil 4 is so good in every single way. It has everything that I love about the series. And everything that I love about the series now, a lot of it started there. Like, there's just everything about it is phenomenal, man. Like, it's the one that pulled me in. Yeah, it's such a banger, and it's like, I love everything about Resident Evil 4. Even, like, there's a, there's a the thing that I, I always see discussed, and it's, I think, the biggest point of contention with the game is Ashley. Yeah. And... <laughs> the president's daughter's been kidnapped. I, it's up to it's us. <laughs> <laughs> the president's daughter, who they specify several times, is 18 years old. <laughs> like, it's, you're playing, I played it recently, and I was like, man, they talk about that a lot. <laughs> like... <laughs> But no, it's uh, Leon's and I just think like Ashley, sweating, looking Ash- side eye at the camera. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even Ashley as a design choice is like a lot of people complain about her, but then like I'm playing and like most of the segments where you need to defend Ashley, you can literally put her in a box. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's a dumpster in just about every segment that you have to protect Ashley in besides the castle. And you can just put her in that box and she's fine. And you just call her out after they can't get her in there. So it's like. It really just everything about that game. I love how like this is really funny to say, but I love how like dumb a lot of the dialogue and and like cheesy and over the top yeah. it is. Leon is such a friggin' hammed up character in that game, and Matt Mercer nailed his characterization <laughs> so well. Like that first line where like my man just showed up in this village, found out that the two people that he had who were his allies were skewered on big fish hooks and cooked over an open fire. He got this entire village turned on him and he had to like hold them off with like scrambled together, like, oh, there's a shotgun in here, cool, bet, let's use that. Some dude tried to decapitate him with a chainsaw. And they all just decided to leave him alone so he gets to live. And he's like this dumb little like, where's everyone going? Bingo? Like, <laughs> Where's everyone going? Bingo? It's all so dumb and over the top. <laughs> and it has so much heart. And I just love it so much. And it is like actually my number one comfort game. I replay this game at least once a year. Um, I actually, I have to do this year's. So I was actually, I almost did it last weekend. But with 8 coming up, I didn't want to do that and then have to play Resident Evil 8. So I still think one of the the best scares for me or like the the discomfort is when you first encounter the first guy with a chainsaw in that game and yeah, it's like it's oh terrifying. this is dangerous <laughs> yeah the knowledge that that is a an enemy that will kill you in one shot no matter what is terrifying yeah. and plus who doesn't and like saying las just... plagas yeah and <laughs> there's actually i've seen some implications that plagas might in some way be involved in the lore of eight, which I'm very excited okay. about. Okay. I had a feeling. Cause, so that's the thing is like, it already obviously has the four comparisons and how it plays and everything. But with Dimitres being a vampire function, her and her daughters being a vampire function and the enemies, the basic, like I, I, I call them the ghouls, but like the dudes, I know you didn't play the demo, but there's these guys that are like these, kind of like lanky dudes in the in the dungeon in the castle demo they are apparently sensitive to light i haven't seen this i've seen people talking about it like it's in the game i just haven't confirmed it myself yet but it, i've seen a lot of people talking about it where like they're sensitive to light and if you draw them towards light sources they actively avoid them and the plagas was a parasite that was specifically sensitive to light in four um that's why flashbangs yeah. instant killed them if you had a plagas on the field so that could just be a way for them to be like, oh, oh, look, haha, that's what like why they're vampires and they're allergic to light because it's actually an offshoot of the Plagas virus. That would be cool. So it would be neat. It would be neat to see some some callbacks like that. I know the last time that I think the Plagas were referenced in the main games was in five when Chris starts trying to determine exactly what the Ouroboros is. He refers to the to the Kennedy report um, and refers to the Plagas. That's the last time I remember it coming up in the main yeah. games. And to this but, day, I still hate like. Oh, headshot, headshot, and then playing that, and it's like headshot, and then all of a sudden a whip tail comes out of the head stump. Yeah, and that's one of the really cool design things they did, because up to that point in Resident Evil, it was optimal to shoot things in the head. Why wouldn't you? That's how zombies work. But then it was like, oh, you're going to shoot them in the head? Guess what, idiot? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then, you know, I like just, it's the game it the that, uh, that teaches you not to trust anymore. <laughs> yeah. And then you play Dead Space, and <laughs> it's like, fair. you can't shoot them anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> no, I, man, I really love Resident Evil 4. I just, I really love that game. It's one that, seen as they're doing all of the remakes, I'm assuming they're probably doing a 4 remake now that they've done the third. So it's getting the VR port. Oh, yes, that's what which it was. looks phenomenal. I don't know if you guys have watched the gameplay on it yet, but, like, they've completely overhauled the systems to actually be, like, it's a VR game. Like, you have to open cabinets and pick things up. It, it uses, um a holster system that VR games use. So you have knife on your left chest. Um, I think like healing item on your left uh, hip, right hip is handgun and, or like basically like sidearm and right shoulder is long arm, like uh, rifle or shotgun. Okay. And uh, it's been completely overhauled where the enemy's still, everything still looks, looks the same air quotes, but it's all been upscaled and like made to look even prettier than the recent like ports have been. So that way you're not getting sick in VR. But the, the animations are still the same. They updated Leon to have better hit collision on his upper body as well, besides just his lower, uh, lower body. So that way in VR, you're actually getting that. 
but it's like it's a VR game. Like you have to manually reload the guns and stuff. It's not just like Resident Evil in first person. It's like a full on VR game, but it's Resident Evil Four. That's it looks cool. so cool. Yeah, it looks really, really cool. I'm actually very excited about I it. I don't care about any of that. Just tell me the merchant is back. He is. <laughs> He's there. <laughs> what are you buying? A wise choice. That's like the one thing I know about this game. Yeah. Did you did you guys see that uh, a little while back? It was going around on Twitter a lot. Someone was going through the Resident Evil 6 art book, and there was a bunch of scrapped uh, extra costumes for the characters. And one of Leon's for 6 was him in his four getup with like the t-shirt and the the chest harness and everything and he had the merchant on his back as a back that is awesome <laughs> he was like riding on his back it was awesome it's like lisa and pt it's just always six inches directly behind your head <laughs> yeah no he was like he was like tied to leon's back so they were back to back and he was like you know how um like did you guys play death Bjorn? stranding no yeah did you play death stranding no so I don't know if you've seen it, but in Death Stranding, you carry bodies on your back and they're on this like little chair thing, kind of. So like, again, back to back, but it's like they're sitting in a chair um, and that's how you carried him. And his jacket would open and that's where you'd take your weapons out <laughs> like, inside his jacket. Like he was your backpack. It was so good. And I'm so mad that costume didn't get in. Like I would pay DLC for that. We still. Yeah. Well, that's what it would have been. Yeah. <laughs> we still joke with that meme. Just like, oh, I need to go to the store. What are you buying? Yeah. Oh, dude, so... all the time. <laughs> everyone, everyone in this friggin' house, like even my friends who haven't played it, like Cam hasn't played it, he'll still reference the the, the merchant, you know. <laughs> so, it's just, there's that nice, uh, terrifying, I don't know, Leviathan creature on the on the yep. water. That's, yes, there is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got Sam with that. We, uh, that part. Way back when, we actually we were uploading let's plays to the YouTube channel before we decided to stop doing that. And one of the ones that we did was I watched Sam play through four for the first time. And I got him to do the uh, shoot the lake 10 times, or I think it's like three or four. Shoot the lake a couple times and have the fish eat you. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, and, and that's the thing is like also just going back to like why I think it's so important. It's a really obvious one because it's it's the history of Resident Evil 4, but it basically made over the shoulder third person shooters a thing. Like it was, it was the first one really. It was the first one that really did that and made it an effective camera angle and like used it very well. It's overall just a well designed game, but that was a huge like just donation to the industry of video games as a whole. <laughs> yeah. That's where all these things come from, you know, and that gets built upon obviously with games like gears of war and stuff like that. But pretty much the source was resident evil four. It's like over time, all of these games here and there that end up becoming the, the trend maker that lasts for the next several years before the next thing pops up. It's yeah. like uncharted kicking off a similar thing for like four or five years um dark souls so it's doing the same thing dark souls oh yeah. yeah although actually when you were talking about the randomized um resident evil mods mm-hmm. i kind of want a resident evil roguelike of just that could be cool you're in like a, a police station or you're in the the mansion and it's just all randomized rooms every time yeah that would be really sick actually and like finding new weapons and stuff man yeah That'd be really cool, damn. I'm surprised that you haven't done anything like that. Yeah, that would be awesome. And if they have, anybody that knows, <laughs> let us know. Yeah. <laughs> my biggest thing with them is just like my biggest thing with Resident Evil as a franchise is just please make a new outbreak. It makes no sense that we haven't gotten a new outbreak yet. Yeah. Um I don't know how familiar you guys are with Outbreak, but that was a game that came out on the PS2 and it utilized online play. Um and it had network play for multiplayer. It was up to four people. It played like Resident Evil 1 remake in the games of that era. So it was like the nicer visuals, but it was still tank controls and isometric camera. But you were, you picked your character. There was a bunch of characters that were just people in the Raccoon City outbreak. So like the highest level of like prepared for combat was like a bodyguard or like a, like I think he was a bouncer or security guard and there was a cop, but he was like a very much like rookie, not rookie, but he was like a beat cop. He wasn't like a big like superstar or anything. Yeah. And then there was like a subway worker. There was a, a nurse too. A, right? uh, yeah, there was a nurse. There was a, I think a waitress was one of them. Uh, there was a mechanic and they all had unique skills and stuff. And it was cool. Cause like, if you got bitten, you'd get infected and you'd have to like find a way to stave off the infection through like pills that you could find in the environment. And if you didn't, your character would actually like, die and come back as a zombie. So like you were a liability to your allies and stuff like that. <laughs> like um, that. I want them to do like an updated current version too. Cause that's the kind of stuff that I feel would 
do much better now. They really should. It would, and it, everyone asks for it, and it's like, with online gaming being obviously as prevalent as it is now, like, they did this thing when online gaming was, like, barely a concept yet, and now that it's, like, so everywhere, it makes yeah. so much sense. When you mentioned it, I'm like, I did remember playing it, and I hated it, and the reason I hated it was because I did not have online play. Yeah, you were playing single player, and it was not balanced for no. that. <laughs> it was boring, and it's like, cool, I can become a zombie for what? Like, it was, it made no sense whatsoever. Yeah, it was impossible. Like, you really couldn't do many objectives at all on single player. The cool thing was that because it was online and everything, there would actually be consistency between, like, you'd still do, like, the loading, like, walk through the door thing that Resident Evil did, but it wouldn't be, like, that previous room wouldn't be unloaded. So, like, you'd go through, and then the zombies would be banging on the door trying to get in type stuff. It was really cool. It was a really cool game that was way ahead of its time, and it deserves to come back. From so the, we've covered from, a lot of Resident Evils this episode now. From the, um, hey, that's, that's what happens when you bring me in. <laughs> <laughs> from the classic era, I think I've played practically all of them. If it wasn't... I think... Was there any on... No, there weren't any on, like, GameCube. Not GameCube, um, Game Boy or anything like that, right? Uh, yes, Gaiden was on Game Boy, I believe. Yeah, I think that's the only one I didn't play. But I even had yeah, the misfortune of Gaiden. playing, like, um, Survivor. Yep. <laughs> um, what else was there? I did one, two, three. Because when did Zero? Zero is what, on GameCube. GameCube, right? Yeah, Gaiden was a Game Boy Color game. Um, there was even, like, uh, actually, Deadly Silence, the DS port of Resident Evil 1, was, like, way better than it should have been. I really I like Code really Veronica. That there. was the last official, like, version of that style of game. Yeah, and I really enjoyed it. Zero was still pretty good too. It was like a nice. Zero was cool. Yeah, it was a nice mix of Zero like classic was... and like the modern at the time because they were remaking it on the GameCube. Yeah, there was something at the end of Zero that was a huge pain in the ass. I just can't remember what it was. I just remember there being like one really unfair fight. Even as someone who like usually thinks that people complain too much about how hard Resident Evil is, I remember there being one fight that was just absolute bullshit. And Zero, Xenomorph. I just can't remember which one it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't I do anything to this thing? <laughs> Chris is just like throwing punches. <laughs> oh, Chris would punch a friggin' hole in a xenomorph, dude. <laughs> Please make that game now. Yeah, I want like RE5 Chris. That was like the peak bulk Chris. That was like when he was absolutely biggest. He was like, fuck yeah. huge in five, dude. I, like, <laughs> that's where our jokes stem from, that it's like getting to the end of the game and the cutscene, oh, the boulder's rolling down. It's like tapping X or tapping square or whatever it was. And then it's just yeah. him throwing a haymaker to destroy a boulder. And it's, bud, if you can do this, why do you carry a gun? Why are you yeah. not just, <laughs> I was going to say fisting your way through. Why are you not just punching your way through <laughs> everything you're encountering in this game? He, I, having played every game, I think his last appearance was in Code Veronica. And his character design between the two makes him go from looking like I don't know, like just a normal human being to like what the rock looks like now. Yeah. yeah. No, Chris. Yeah. The last time Chris showed up before five was in code Veronica X and he was a normal dude. Yeah. He didn't look anything. <laughs> and then he showed up crazy. in five and he was, yeah. he showed up in five and he was a friggin' bulk Lord just juiced. <laughs> <laughs> like his vascular veins are all like bulging. Chris, you've been gone since fight. like resident evil one. Where have you been? Like, Oh, the gym. <laughs> <laughs> to fight monsters you must become Been preparing one. <laughs> my return <laughs> <laughs> don't gaze into the abyss chris <laughs> <laughs> so that is resident evil 4 yep hunnigan is that you finally the line's jack free hey hunnigan no glasses forget the glasses what's the status of the mission i've rescued the subject we're returning home you did it leon thanks you know, you're kind of cute without those glasses. Give me your number when I get back. May I remind you that you're still on duty. Story of my life. Which brings us to Nicholas, number one. You showed me this one, and I recently finished and actually, rather, let me rephrase, I recently took the time to actually finish the game because we would always pick it up and then um, always get distracted like halfway through and never end up finishing it, but... This is The Forest. So good. Ooh, good pick. Great game. Yep. Um, Psyched for the sequel. I, I really yeah. enjoyed it playing, you know, with friends. And then um, that same streaming community that I watch, Neebs Gaming, they have a whole, like, they, they took the game and they kind of, like, red versus blue 
kind of like they take it and like turn it into machinima, but it's very meta because you know it's them playing the game, but they act like mm-hmm. it's them actually being the people doing the thing. Like, oh, I've got to find my son. I got to find my son. But they talk very meta stuff that's clearly not like they're playing a video game. And it's meant to be a comedy show and it's hilarious, but watching them play it got me the urge to like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to finish it. And then me and my partner decided like, since it's co-op, you know, let's fuck it. Let's just go from start to finish and we'll try to do it. We did a little bit every night. We made sure like our, hit all these caves and it's just so cool on the amount of like the construction. I've played plenty of survival stuff, but I always personally hated like, I want to make a door. All right. You need to cut down six redwood trees to make the frame for one door. Like I know that doesn't make any sense because the amount of actual wood to a door is like, I no, but in this game, that's that's exactly what it is. You're like, all right, I need to cut down a tree. You get the the planks and you actually see the pieces translate from tree to thing that you're making. I thought that was cool. I just liked us rolling in when we started playing first on co-op and it would be, there's our forest and we just strip mine the entire place. (laughs) Yeah. We just start getting into that rhythm of like, okay, we have four guys here and then just three start chopping. One is putting everything together. Yeah. uh, Exactly. My, my brother and a couple of my friends, they had a server they were playing on. I couldn't because they'd play during the day when I was at work because they're, they're still home. Um, But I'd check in on them and I'd see what they were doing. And I was like, bro, how can they even call this game the forest anymore? Because they just live on like a plane. Because like all the trees are gone. <laughs> like everything's been mined. And, just and like a scout. Down. It's like, I see them coming three days out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the crafting is cool. I really like how you get to combine all the stuff into what you're trying to make. And then. Oh, your the, teeth axe. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and then the actual building crafting in itself, you use like your little crafting guide and. Like, uh, you can customize, you can make pre-built stuff, and it's pretty cool. It's different than the standard, like, um, survival action game that a lot of them have been coming out ever since, like, Minecraft, Ark, um, Rust. The forest could fit in that category, and it does belong in it, but the single-person or co- cooperative narrative for a story is a lot more than some of the other games actually provide. I didn't get deep enough. I played that a little bit with you guys, right? That's what we were playing, the forest yeah. with the candles. Yeah, and I didn't. All that. I obviously didn't play enough. Yeah, with the Cronenbergs. My schedule just yeah. got crazy. But... Really good monster designs in that game. Yeah, yeah, and it's so disarming when it's like, okay, so playing it the first time, you're just kind of going through, picking up your stuff, and then all of a sudden you hear like just sticks cracking or like leaves crunching, and you're looking mm-hmm. around. And then you just might see like a a trail of something running behind trees in the distance and then just having them come at you at night to attack your camp, get dragged down into a cave, trying to get back out. It's such an intense experience that I will never forget the forest. Yeah, I remember the first time we were playing. So there was there were points when I got to play with my friends, just like I wasn't there for most of it. But one night I was playing with them because we managed to get on like at nighttime and (laughs) one of my friends got caved and we had to go find him (laughs) and it was so funny because he's just like he's on the mic and he's like guys this is so fucked up he's like (laughs) you will not believe the shit that's down here (laughs) it was so funny also the fact that like you go sneak into the cave and then you go down the ropes and some of the caves that it's like you're going down, 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 down. It's like, how deep is this? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, like an MGS3, like, friggin' uh, What a Thrill kicks in. Yeah. Like, <laughs> fucking Snake Eater starts playing. Like, I don't think I've ever been as uncomfortable. Well, one of the most uncomfortable things is when you're playing as a group and it's time for all of you to, like, go up the rope to get back out of the cave and you're the last one of the group to go up and you're just, like, <laughs> waiting. It's like when uh, Robert Shaw and Jaws, when he's saying, like, the most terrified I was in the water after the Indianapolis sank is being the last one on the helicopter and you're waiting down in your water for your turn. That was the forest. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> a great summation. So are you playing uh, the sequel? If it ever comes out. Yeah, seriously, at this point. I like the new trailer that was released. I like. I fucking hate when a game company is like, hey, we got this new game coming out. Check out the trailer. And it's a fully CG video with no in-game. Like, that 
doesn't sell me at all, buddy. Like, I already want your product. You giving this to me is like showing me a picture of a steak when you don't even sell steak and you know I'm hungry. Like, yes, I, I want it, <laughs> but I don't know what your product even looks like. Do you even have this? Is it going to be the same thing? I don't know. So then they finally yeah, yeah. released the trailer. I'm like, wow, this actually looks fucking amazing. They, they, you could tell it's the same system. They updated it and, it, you know, with modern graphics too. Cause I mean, the forest looks good, but there's still a lot of room for improvement for it being like a game that's like, how old is it? Like six, seven years old? Uh, yeah, I bought it when it was in early yeah. access. Like, I, I bought it actually, like, I think. I wonder, can you see when you bought stuff on Steam? Maybe. Uh, yeah. Because I think I bought it, like, the first week it was up, if I remember correctly. I remember seeing it very early. I know, it hit early access the year we moved to Mass. So that would have been, like, 2014, I think? I have 73 hours logged into it. Because I remember it hitting early access. I bought it the day that it hit early access. I got two copies to get my brother into it. And then he logged on, like, once, never came back again. I was like, well, this is going to be an uncomfortable single player playthrough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the last time. So I can see my earliest. The earliest I'm seeing on here is 2015 for me. It officially released April 30th, 2018. Yeah. And I can see the earliest I was playing. Wow. It, it looks like it was January 10th, 2015. So it's been a bit. Yeah. So I, I'm ready for a sequel yeah. at this point. Yeah, definitely time. Dean, if you ever wanted to play through. I'm sure we'll we can go back through before the sequel comes out and play a beginning to end the forest. I don't even we didn't even really get that far at all. I don't no. think I barely played it. You just gotta like, like as long a, as we, we go there a couple with caves, determination, but... we can get through it fairly quickly. Because every time I've picked it up, the problem I have with it is like so. If you don't know, the game is is about you're on a plane, you're flying with your son, something you, the the plane crashes, you wake up, you see this naked guy in decked out in like all red paint he steals your son and then like you you fall back asleep and then when you wake up you know you're like oh shit where's my son i gotta find him and then you're just finding clues and like little breadcrumbs that your kid is leaving behind with these pictures that he's drawing and you're trying to figure out where he is and that's the whole game but you don't actually have to do any of that you can just basically build and just survive and every time we played i always felt like we got so fixated on building a base and not focusing on anything else that i felt once i actually decided all right i'm gonna beat it this time i still did the base thing but i did bare minimum of necessity and i made sure to constantly only like i didn't get like 10 different grilling stations and you know all the water pots and all that like all of my food is going to be gotten or received from the caves and i only have like dried fish and like a water a water jug with me in the event that i don't have soda or um snacks to eat as the main source of food and that really helped keep focused on always stay in the caves keep finding more stuff because once you get comfortable outside uh, that's, that's you start to lose interest real quick, real quick, and it's the caves that really draw you in when it comes to the story. Yeah, yeah. I was just concerned about trying to get better at shooting birds with my crude bow and arrow. <laughs> <laughs> A true hunter at heart. <laughs> that was my focus on the game. It's like, all right, I'll follow you guys when you say it's time to go to the caves. I want to kill some birds. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so yeah, the forest is. A great pick. Yeah. Which I guess brings... Dean, your third and final. Third and final. So what is your scariest from... game of all time? <laughs> I think this one straddles the line between it's it was scary and it's like also very good. Um, are you saying not? I didn't play this. <laughs> 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 I meant like my other... I mean, Resident Evil, I guess, yeah, it's good. But like subjective it wasn't just it wasn't just how scared i was but i actually didn't play this game i watched somebody else play it because that's how i do horror games <laughs> okay but um it was one of my good friends from high school one of those guys you lo lose contact with but i always had this memory with him slept over at his house he had playstation 2 and he had played through this game i guess once or twice because he just knew with the ins and outs of it and he's like he essentially played it for me like 
let's play this game, and it was Silent Hill 2. You promised you'd take me there again someday. James! It's our special place. Silent Hill 2. Rated M for Mature for PlayStation 2 from Konami. Yep. Yeah. Very good choice for top. That yeah. was that was a really tough one, was where to put Silent Hill 2. And that's actually, I, I did, like I said, my, my second and first uh, picks were the same for objective and subjective. My subjective third was... Reckoning? Reckoning, Hunter? yes. Yes, yeah. Hunter uh, Reckoning. Uh, uh. Um, but my, my objective third was Silent Hill 2. It's, it's a great game. <laughs> Yeah, it's just going back and watching it, you know, just scanning through it and like kind of like reliving it. It's it, it it stuck with me and it's just like I think it looked thinking of PS2 graphics, like I think it really it was like ahead of its it was like really well done, like it's graphically it and like just the scariest element I think for me is was the ambience and sound design and the fact that most of the game, you have that just flashlight on your on your chest, and you're limited to just wherever you're looking is what you can <laughs> see, and just like it's always just that stuff that's just that sense of dread that's just outside of you. As far as like the the, the really scary moments, but it's also like very introspective and like psychological with like the story that's going on with uh, James Sunderland and his dead wife. He comes back to Silent. I I don't know anything about the first game. Um, Different but character. This, First one yeah, is, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with it. It's it's like a different part of town. The second part, uh, Silent Hill Two. James Ma- or Harry Mason was the Harry first Mason. character. Yep. James Mason. <laughs> James Mason. Welcome to Silent Hill. <laughs> <laughs> this was the one with the radio. Let's see that right? game. That would start to do like yeah, the radio noise. that it distorted had that. when one had that distorted well. when you were close to a yeah. enemy. Yeah, the radio so is that, a uh, a standby feature. That's that's been in, in all of them. It's great. It's such a good way to handle it. Yeah, it's a cool, just like, also, you know, to, you know, what, how, I must have been 13 or 14 maybe when I watched him play through this, something around there. So, hey, I'm a scaredy cat, but it was easy, to, it was easier watching him play, and it was just like a good story too. Like, it's, um, he's going, his dead wife writes, you know, writes him a letter, and he goes back to this town, Silent Hill, where they visited years ago, and, um, supposedly and um encounters all these characters there and you kind of realize that they've all done something kind of terrible in their lives and come to this town and this town represents something different to each one of them and like deals a lot with guilt and loss and like she's just like i don't know like it beyond beyond the terror it was just like a very like harrowing kind of experience (laughs) with the story itself perfect for a growing kid um yeah it's like well yeah my formative years i'm like yeah but like i didn't I pyramid head. I don't know why that should be a scary thing, but like he's absolutely terrifying. Yeah, I think <laughs> once you when you first see him and you and you know his sounds and like when you hear them later on, there's like a good moment where like you touch this like fence and it's like oh it's like kind of rusty and it's about to fall and then you hear his knife dragging and you kind of start freaking out and the door in front of you is locked and you're like shit 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 and yeah. he just like storms you and like bum rushes you through these gates and uh, you learn later he's just kind of like a character you invented in your head to like punish yourself for murdering your wife. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> spoiler. Yeah. Spoiler. It is, if we're going to get into it, then yeah, it's uh, I think one of the most interesting parts of two is the slow turn and the slow realization of how bad of a person James is. Yeah. Um, I think it's really interesting to see that it's like, Oh no, you're the bad guy in this story. Like you are a terrible, yeah. terrible person. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I mean, what ending did you guys get when you played? Oh, I, I, don't I think it. I think based on the boss fight, I mean, it being a boss fight, I think is the ending. Like it's like the mm-hmm. tri- It's like the Maria in disguise. Like yeah, I think it's like the woman like flying around like yeah. on the rooftop. Yeah. So that was the ending that we got. Gotcha. Yeah. Because there's one of the things that I think is really cool about Silent Hill too. Yeah, there's like six of them. Yeah, there's a bunch of them, and one of them is actually accessed by. Um, if you get hurt and you leave yourself at low health, basically you have a meter that's hidden. It doesn't tell you anywhere that you have this stat and you can't track right. it. But 
if you you can track it if you like know the metrics which people have like worked out at this point so like you can technically keep track of it if you do a lot of like if you have like a little chart that you keep you can keep track of where you are for this but getting hurt and leaving yourself at low health for extended amounts of time um specifically there's an item you get that is a knife and you can inspect it like you can inspect all items the knife doesn't do anything in the game but you can inspect it and every time you inspect it it adds to this meter and basically there's an ending where James ends up committing suicide and that's directly affected by how well you take care of yourself and how much you look at this knife and stuff like that. Oh, that's how you unlock ah. that one. Yeah. Yeah, he t- drives over a cliff in that ending. Yeah, it's uh it's just interesting that there's like that that very again like kind of like almost meta like tracking more things about how you play the game and like your state of right. mind towards your character and that affecting your ending I think is really interesting. That's a very PT kind of thing of yeah yeah it's like all these little minute things that you're doing that are going to end up making a big impact overall i haven't played it yeah, since exactly. being a teenager and it just sucks on like there are a few games that i've been wanting to replay but i just i don't i don't know how without having yeah. to yeah. buy a playstation one or at this point like a playstation two to pick up the original where did the remake land they did a silent hill like HD it was collection bad or something, yeah right? it was bad it, um, oh, it was bad. Okay. Yeah, it it ran like garbage. They changed out like there's a really famous one that's really funny to me where there's the ranch in Silent Hill 2. In my restless dreams, I see that town. Silent Hill. It's a little wild and a little strange. When you make a home. And uh, the sign for Silent Hill Ranch, the font has been changed to Comic Sans for some reason. Uh, <laughs> so there's a sign that just says Silent Hill Ranch and Comic Sans on it. <laughs> like, it's, it's real bad. Like, it's just a really bad port. I got a letter. A dead person can't write a letter. Mary died of that damn disease three years ago. Sing it. But sir, that's the scariest thing in this whole game. Of this anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> My God, <laughs> has gone too far. Of fonts. <laughs> what what kind cool of people am Helmetica. I dealing with? <laughs> with them doing all of the the Resident Evil remasters, because they've been doing good work as far as that, it'd be great to see like a company go back to do the Silent Hill games, just because. I feel like it might be, as Nick said, accessibility that's holding back so many people from being able to actually get in on this series. And it may be a case of, yeah, well, if a new one comes out, I might not care as much because I didn't play any of the previous ones. I feel like Resident Evil, because they're constantly making new ones, there's always a current system that you could at least kind of try to pick something up on. The thing I don't understand is that what is Konami currently doing as their main profit driving like pachinko machines yeah was- <laughs> yeah so no he's right because i remember when yeah. um metal gear 3 got a remake and everyone was like oh my god this is gonna be amazing they put it on a p- pachinko machine yeah it was real bad and they actually um they just announced recently that they're they're shifting their focus back to games though they did put out a statement uh in regards to because they're not showing up at e3 they they had said they were going to they just bowed out this week, but they said it's just because they don't have anything ready in time. But they said our all our focus is on video games right now, and we have a couple really big projects in the works. Because with Kojima getting fired or leaving or whatever, like I get both yeah. perspectives because I I love Hideo's work and everything that he's done. Metal Gear is one of my favorite franchises of all time. I'm sorry if I'm ignorant on this. Did he have involvement with Silent Hill? Not Silent Hill before Silent Hills. Yeah. Silent Hills was his first uh, involvement yeah. with the franchise. So I think that might have just been Konami putting all of their eggs in one basket with the most recent one because they shot themselves in the foot. And I think at this point now, the decision's made. He's no longer with us. We can never go down that route again. And with how everything was marketed and with how things were left with Hideo leaving, I don't think they'll ever return to the silent hill genre again yeah i i don't think hideo would just go back to konami but i could absolutely we've discussed it a couple times on itvg but i could see a scenario where with sony or microsoft acting as intermediary 
where they're basically like, look, give it, let us make a game under the Silent Hill IP, and Konami's like, okay. And then once they get it, like, okay, cool, we're going to contract Koji Pro to work on this. And that's, like, I think our best bet of that happening, which I could see happening. Yeah. I could see them doing that because it makes a lot of sense. Sony's a pro at doing that, seeing as they lent out Spider-Man for the Marvel movies. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's no stranger to them. Exactly. You could tell he... I wonder how much he had to, he scrapped, like how much work was done on that game, like creative know, and like we've got this all laid out and it's like eh, it's, it's hard just to t- his final used. couple of years was really just a lot of stories and hearsay and it's really tough to kind of narrow down as to what's going on because I mean like with the development of Metal Gear Five it was oh an utter nightmare <laughs> and that's why like yeah I get both sides because I respect his creative decision. But at the same time, like, uh, enough's enough. Like, get your product out there. You've taken way too long. Yeah. And he, he started to fall too far down the auteur rabbit hole. Yeah. And sometimes just the, the like, how avant-garde do you want to really be before it's just pretentious at this point? So just yeah. <laughs> yeah. let it go. Just go. <laughs> well, I'm just waiting for Konami to hire back this hot, new hotshot Shmidio Shmoshmina when he comes back with like a mustache, <laughs> just like a big hat, no sunglasses. What was, his, uh, what was his name when he was still doing the White Whale Studios thing? It was like Joachim Modrum or something like that. <laughs> just pop he had back all the bandages in. on his face. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. I, I like think Yo- it worked. Like Joachim Modrum. <laughs> <laughs> so Dean, I think uh, Silent Hill Two is a it's a pretty decent game. For not being a horror man. And if you don't like horror Pyramid man. Head, have you ever seen the Silent Hill movie? I know, but I, I, I was just thinking, oh, I should look up the scene I've heard where he just like rips, destroys that woman. <laughs> where yeah. he grabs yeah. like <laughs> the top of her head and pulls her entire skin right off in one. Yeah. Scene. yeah. I just I look up and look that part up. Resident Evil 1, or not Resident Evil, Silent Hill 1, like the first movie, is actually like a decent interpretation of the story. And it was actually like fairly good. And then. Yeah. What was the second one? Revelations or something? That had Jon yep. Snow um, in it, right? Kid Harrington? Yeah. Yep. Yes. And it was like... it. That was the Heather one, and I really like Heather as a character. And I just feel like they didn't do Heather right at all. I was like, man, I just remember seeing it in theaters, and I was like... I went to, I went to theaters to see it. Yep. And I was like, man. <laughs> it's one of those movies that I saw it in theaters once, and then that was it. And every so often, I'm like, I kind of want to go back and watch it just to see, like... Was it bad? And I just, they don't have it like on streaming, and it's like, eh, I don't want to pay money for it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not first that one's curious. Good. I like the first one. Yeah, the first one still holds up. The the casting for Sybil Bennett, um, what's her name? She was Angela in The Walking Dead. Um, oh, um, she was great, though. She was like perfect for that role. Yeah. She was really good in that. And um, was it Jodie Ferdell as the. The kid as in the that one. Woman. Yeah. Oh yeah, as the kid. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I think it was. No, it was was like, it Rada Mitchell as the, the mother? I think so. Yeah, and Sean Bean was the husband, who doesn't die. So yeah, well, good I job think he's breaking the that second Sean one. Bean curse. I think he's in the second one, and I think he dies in the second one. Yeah, he does. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the case. You can't run forever, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> you're on borrowed time, there, buddy. Yeah, who? This is going to drive me crazy. Lori Holden. Lori Holden. Yeah. Yes. For, uh, for Sybil Bennett slash Angela. But yeah, that's, I kind of want to go back and rewatch it. Maybe that'll be, when's the rotation for my screen refresh pick? Maybe that'd be, uh, that'll be my movie. Hmm. So yeah, Silent Hill 2. Good choice, Dean. brings us to my number one to round this out at of our all time of all time two and 48 mark here <laughs> uh so this was the the earliest of three games on my list uh, on xbox 360 in 2005 uh, i remember playing the ever loving hell out of this demo when back when demos were kind of a big thing on xbox uh it is condemned criminal origins from the bureau do no good. Someone else killed those policemen. Shot with your weapon, and you will be blamed for their deaths. Open up, it's the police. Get 
He's right above us. There's one coming your way. People are scared. We need to get this one. Sweet. That's such a cool Ooh. freaking game, man. <laughs> so this one, like, I... I loved everything about this game. The sequel still I had fun with. It's not as good as the first, but at least like it still mm -hmm. scratches the itch at the time. For anybody unfamiliar, it's a first person survival horror with gun and melee combat. And since you're a criminal investigator, you're getting in, uh, you go to a number of crime scenes and kind of you encounter things throughout the game where we have to use various tools like UV lights and cameras and uh, whatnot to gather evidence at these crime scenes. And you send them back for analysis or figure out more information for the case because you play as Ethan Thomas. He is a investigator who begins a case on a serial killer called the matchmaker. And when you arrive at the scene, you and some other cops end up hearing a noise. You think it's the guy. So you decide to split up and go looking for them. And while you're looking for them in this building, you end up getting your gun taken. You got knocked out and your gun gets taken. And then you end up finding the guy who took your gun who then proceeds to shoot the other cops with your gun and bumps you out of a building. So now you're on the run, you're framed for murder, you're still hunting the original serial killer, and now there's another guy running around who is bumping off all the serial killers using their own kind of trademarks. It's so like the matchmaker, he sets up all these people in kind of these like mannequin poses and things like that. So serial killer X is the serial killer who's kind of hunting all of the other ones down. He tells Ethan, like, I'm on the, uh, we're kind of doing the same thing. You're hunting them down. I'm hunting them down. I'm just killing them. So while you're trying to find the guy, the whole city's kind of going crazy. Uh, for some reason, birds are dropping out of the sky. Homeless people are just fighting in the streets. People are getting violent. And I res still remember my favorite level in the entire game is, I think it was like the third level when you get to the department store at the mall, when you're hunting down the matchmaker. And it's all these mannequins in the store and you'll mm -hmm. like turn around. And when you turn back, the mannequins have moved or the mannequins are like now <laughs> circling you behind. <laughs> and it's, is it cliche? Maybe, but it's effective and it's great. <laughs> um, and the, as far as the combat itself, like you get guns throughout the game, but you can only carry one. Um, it's very sparse ammo throughout the game. So it's usually kind of a pick up, use it, drop it because it's not going to be a carry this for the rest of the level kind of deal. But you have a lot of like pipes, boards, things of that sort, a board with a nail in it. He's got a board with a nail in it. And you also get a taser that charges up over time and you can shock a guy and you have legs that can kick. So for a very long time in this game, back in 20 or er, 2005, I would love to stun gun people and then kick them in the groin throughout my entire <laughs> playthrough of this game. It was my go-to. Yeah. I, I feel like maybe I'm remembering wrong, but didn't Condemned also make it where, like, if you kicked them, like, in the nuts, it would be, like, actually, like, it would be, like, you actually kicked them in the nuts, like, there was, yeah, actually, they like, would, a reaction to it? Yeah. So it would yeah. be, like, they'd drop down. Yeah. So it it was a blast. I love that. And I love how your guns, like, if you have the a shotgun or something, you can flip it around and use it like a melee weapon. But as you do it, it'll actually, like, break the stock. And then you wouldn't be able to use the gun. So it's, like, I'm out of ammo. And then you can literally just beat somebody with it until the gun just breaks apart and then you have to go find something else. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna ask if the uh if the mannequin sequence was in in Criminal Origins or Bloodshot, because yeah. that was so cool. The the bear was in Bloodshot, I remember that. Yeah. Which Bloodshot added cool stuff with like the environmental kills and the finishers and things mm -hmm. like or actually I think the finishers were in the first one too. Where I think when you so. knock a guy to their people. knees and they're stunned like you have the option of hitting on the D-pad to either like do a finishing blow, snap their neck, headbutt them, which was just kind of a, does it really affect how they go out? Not really. It's just kind of a fun choice on animations. So I always dug it. Yeah, that was a cool game. It was like, I think it's really like, it's really funny listening to you. Not even funny, but it's like, it's interesting listening to you recap kind of like the general synopsis of the plot. Because that game was like, in retrospect, that game was so high concept. There were so many friggin' things going on in that yeah. game. <laughs> it's, it's there like so many a, moving parts again give me like an a prestige series like give me a hbo max thing give me like a netflix thing of this guy tracking down killers you get this like police procedural that then goes slowly more supernatural and off the rails as time goes on until the game ends with like 
creatures and psychosis and like seeing things coming out of walls and I think right now it's on Steam for like seven bucks, the PC version. So anybody out there can still experience it without having to have a 360. More games need to do that. I think they need to have PC ports. I understand the logistics behind it, but I think a game's longevity really helps if you can put it on PC because you can go back and play it. Like Alan Wake, I finally was able to repurchase it on Steam. I can pick that up at any time now and I'm, I'm good. I don't have to try to dig up my 360, you know, make sure that it, um, the disc even isn't scratched or anything like that, or even have the disc for that matter. It's just up, oh, just reinstall it. All right, I'm good to go. Yeah. I mean, it's essentially Steam is like the game archive of, yeah, there's not going to be like, oh, I played on my PC2 or like my PC36. Like, there's no, <laughs> there's never going to be the new version of it unless you're playing a game that can't possibly run on a current system just because it's, like it doesn't it's not compatible kind of deal. I know there's some yeah. older games like I I can't play Morath's World from the old uh, what was it like the not the three quarter floppies, whatever the, the giant thin ones were back in the day, like the B drive mm. discs. But yeah, like that's the kind of stuff at some point you just kind of lose. But everything else, port it and throw it on, even if it's not like an HD remaster, I'll spend 10 bucks on it and just buy it again just so I have it for a, a rainy nostalgic day. There you go. Yeah, I just checked. It's uh, it's fifteen bucks right now on Steam. So yeah, I actually I... just bought it <laughs> <laughs> it's to carry you until uh, whenever it's time to play Resident Evil. Resident Village. Evil, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I think it's a lot of these things that get lost over time, and it's the games that we're growing up on. I know um, I didn't mention them here, but some of the ones that were now are hard to find only because they were like the well into I think like the mid nineties, late nineties, but stuff like was it Dangerous Dave Rooms of Doom or something like uh Goosebumps Escape from Horrorland or Shivers. Mm-hmm. Um these are all ones that were great horror games for their time and would still be fun now, even outside the nostalgic thing, but it's tough to get because even if they make it available on like some sort of uh shovelware website, you can't really run it easily because it's just not compatible with current uh, operating systems. It's not a horror game, but it's actually relevant with the new Pokemon snap that's just released. I really wanted to play the N64 one. It's not available on any of Nintendo's platforms. And then the worst part is that I downloaded the emulator to play it and the emulation's broken. I can't proceed past a certain point. So it's like, cool i can still try to replay this game from my childhood but unless i have an n64 laying around with the actual game cartridge like this sucks yeah Yeah. and i'd like i'd be willing to bet i haven't checked but i bet that game's probably going for like 60 to 80 bucks resale oh yeah yeah i remember um back when i before we moved up here my brother had broken out the n64 and he was playing pokemon snap for a while yeah because he just keeps all his consoles and all of his games over the years so he, so Nick, give him a call. Just show up at the house and just say you're here to play Pokemon <laughs> Snap. Well, he knows I'm interested now. I demand so. it. <laughs> it's like the time you showed up at my house to play through Metal Gear. What was it? Was it four? Yeah. 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 You yeah, like brought four. your own TV. You brought your own like pillows and blanket. It's so, not like, oh, we're going to do this together. It's like, no, I'm here to play this. Yeah, Tim if lived you want to watch a, it, you can hang out. Tim lived in a two bedroom <laughs> house and or a, a, a two family house rather. And the downstairs tenant was no longer there. So it was empty. So I'm like, yo, I'm just, you got a couch down there. I'm going to bring my TV over. Can I borrow like your PlayStation for like a, the weekend? And I just marathoned <laughs> Metal Gear four from start to finish. Yep. I did not nice. like at random points throughout the weekend. I would just walk downstairs and just kind of pop in and it's like, Oh, where are we at? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Good times. So yeah, I I would love like act, finally being able after all this time talk horror games. I would love to like. There's a bunch of stuff on the honorable mentions list. I know as I've said more recently, I'm trying to avoid actually mentioning my honorable mentions just because if we come back and do another episode, I would love to be able to spend the appropriate amount of time talking about them. But mm-hmm. for anybody else, are there any honorable mentions that haven't been honorably mentioned? Nope. Well, yeah, fatal uh, fatal frame. Ooh. Great games, just all of them, or all the ones that I've played, at least. I've played the first three, and I know people don't like three as much, but I love all of them, honestly. That's the photo one, right? Sorry? That's the, you, you take pictures, right, of the ghost? 
Yep, yeah, camera obscura. So it's uh, it's more Japanese centric horror. The ghosts are more Japanese stuff like that you'd see in like Ring or like Juan or something like yeah. that. And it's just a uh, really cool, very very effective horror. That one of the segments that I I will never forget is there's a point where you have to go down under the house for a bit, and you're like under the floorboards. It's like probably like a two foot tall, two and a half foot tall crawl space, and you're moving through it. It's in first person through the camera, and there's a ghost down there. That fucking does the like the very Japanese like crab walk ghost thing, <laughs> and it's under there with you, and it'll just like come around corners at you and stuff like that, and it's terrifying. I remember like kind of uh, back in the day, it, I think it was like Resident Evil, Silent Hill, Fatal Frame, and Clock Tower. I feel like were the all the horror games that everybody always used to talk about. Yeah, Fatal Frame and Clock Tower were the two that I never ended up getting a chance to check out yeah, yeah i always hear about them especially and i always hear great things but it was just one of those instances like i just never got close enough to actually pick it up yeah that one's really good um siren is cool for what it is oh, i wasn't super into siren curse? but it's neat yeah like blood curse and and the earlier ones because there was just siren yeah and then there's um there's one more that i'm trying to think of it's gonna drive me crazy man give me one second i'll see if i can find it Honorable mention is uh, I think it's the end of Batman Arkham Knight. Is that where where is that where you Joker takes over and then he's like haunted by Batman in this like dream world? Oh, I thought you were gonna say the where you have to go to the Penguins Iceberg Lounge. I did yeah. mention him. I, I, <laughs> I thought you were gonna, I did mention that show. You were gonna bookend the episode with it. Oh yeah, that's just a. I was gonna mention Dino horrible, Crisis, but horrible moment. I hadn't played that one in too long. Ooh, Vampire Knight. I uh, I remember the other one. Uh, Ill Bleed was also really cool. That one I don't even know. Ill Bleed was a I believe it was Dreamcast, and it was ah, just a really why. weird like out there horror game. The whole thing was like it was. So you they were all like supposed to be kind of like horror movie sets, and you had to just go through and do like different objectives and then like try to escape like on like a, it was it's a very goofy game like look up gameplay i know if you if you watch them uh oni plays did uh play through vill bleed for for bony plays and it's just really like funny silly japanese horror game it's like not scary it's just funny and it's like really goofy and, and dumb and exactly my kind of shtick personally i was gonna say like i'm surprised this well then again it's because it's dreamcast and i didn't have one i'm surprised a horror game of going through horror movie sets was not something that was on my radar growing up. Yeah. I had one. It's not a horror game, really, but uh, I really liked Grab by the Ghoulies when I was a kid. That was the rare, rare <laughs> one that they made. I liked that game. <laughs> Remember playing, uh, what was it, Monster Bash on PC, where you're just like yep. this Mighty Max kid with a slingshot taking out uh, monsters. Yeah, that was cool. I liked uh, Nightmare Creatures is like a weird game that's it's a cool like little relic. Where it's like, it's a tank control game, but it's more like an action combat game. So like, you're fighting monsters with like, swords and shit, but it controls like Resident Evil. Because <laughs> I remember having Nightmare Creatures on N64. Was that the the original, or was there another one to that series? I think it was both. I think it, I think, because I think there was just one. And I think oh, it just okay. came out on both systems. Because I just played it on my PlayStation. I think I still have my copy, actually. I remember the commercials. Never played it, but I remember distinctively hearing, like, nightmare creatures. This city will be consumed by a horde of nightmare creatures. Yeah, there was a sequel, apparently, but that's not the one that I played. I did play Nightmare Creatures 1. Yeah, just so many... Ah, hell, I'll just mention them all. You remember Eternal Darkness, <laughs> Sanity's Requiem? Okay. Fuck you, we're not talking yes, about that in a five-second segment. <laughs> Yeah, that one has to. No, get, like, that's forward. not honorable mention, Tim. That's like a main episode <laughs> release. <laughs> okay, we'll come back to that one, and I'll, I'll expand on my uh, FMV escape from Horrorland with Jeff Goldblum as Dracula. <laughs> like you said, like it, like modern Jeff Goldblum too, not like the one from like the nineties yeah. and shit. Like Zaddy Jeff Goldblum. Like yeah, you, you, you see that um, the meme of him 
getting the interview and like, hey, have you heard about how like there's kind of a divorce happening with like Sony and Marvel with when it comes to Spider Man? And his just like a like you can tell he equally has no idea what she's talking about, doesn't care, but doesn't portray that like he's gonna be a <laughs> dick about it. But like, no, I I I had no idea. And then he's just making like weird mouth noises and shit. Like Yeah. yeah. But then like oh, that so same good. that same like mentality energy. But as Dracula. Yeah. Yeah, like the world according to Jeff Goldblum, Jeff Goldblum, yeah. like that. Like as it, Dracula. If you guys have never seen it, I I really wanna I found it on um I think GOG or GOG or whatever it is, that I can actually get a version to play for that game that I want to track down and I should just like stream it or something beginning to end. But that's one of the ones that defined my childhood. A time capsule of one FMV games, but then also like a Goosebumps FMV game with Jeff Goldblum. Also the werewolf in that game was played by Mark Queso, who was uh, in <laughs> Seems oh, to be yeah. Ninja Turtles too. Leonardo. Yeah. Huh. So Six degrees there connects all our episodes. Every Secret time. of the Use was like my favorite one of those too. Dean would disagree. Well, those two would agree with you, I think, right? Yeah. Those two being Tim and Nick. Are you I, are you more of a Turtles in Time man? Oh, I oh wait, I don't think any of us are three. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay, because I was gonna say. Like, <laughs> oh no, the first movie all the way. For, okay, that's fair. Yeah, I really like Secret of the Use. Yeah. Well, it's like, what do you like better, Star Wars or The Empire Strikes Back? Like, I like, I kind of like them both equally, but it depends yeah, on like, like two sides of the reasons. same coin. Or not, not to, you know what? Star Wars is a bad example, but more like Alien versus Aliens. They're both there amazing yeah. films, but the tone is so. There different. you go. That's a good comparison. So, do we have any more honorable mentions that don't deserve their own episode? I think I've exhausted my list. Don't ask that question again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gang, that wraps up another episode of Rule of Thirds, and we'd like to thank you for coming along for the ride and discussing our favorite horror games. As always, you can reach us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Screen Refresh, or shoot an email to screenrefresh at gmail.com to let us know what your top three would be, or if you have topics you want to hear us discuss. Josh, where can people track you down on the internet and airwaves? Uh, you can find me personally over at spook underscore Spiegel. You're mainly just going to get shit posts. That's just <laughs> fair warning. Uh, <laughs> but I do also uh, co-host on a podcast called Into the Video Game. We've been going for, sh we just hit 200 episodes. So I think it's, and going weekly without Congratulations. Breaks. Thank you. Yeah, we just, uh, this week was 201. So I think that's been just about four years now um, that we've been doing this. So it's been a bit. Um, so coming up on season two. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you can uh, you can find all of our old podcasts, all of our backlog, and everything on into the video game dot libsyn dot com. We uh, we actually just started live streaming our podcasts with episode two hundred. So we we actually live stream the recording process. So you can listen to them after release, or you can listen to them when we record them like live. And that starts right around five five thirty on Wednesdays, and that's Eastern time um every week on wednesdays and then you can follow that account at i uh at itvg podcast so you keep up with that we basically do we're a strictly video game podcast that's why it was nice to be on here because i can talk about stuff that's not video games without getting flogged <laughs> by the boys um, <laughs> and it's uh we do a lot of industry analysis and stuff like that so it's a bit a bit less like we still we still make jokes and everything but it's a lot more like talking about the business side of things like business acquisitions, uh, potential for the future, projections, that kind of stuff. So uh, it's a good time, and we've been doing it for a while, so we have a good time with it. It lets me be all lazy by important. just listening to that to get all of my gaming news. <laughs> there you go. That's fair. I hear that a lot, actually. We've gotten that from a couple <laughs> other podcasts that are like, yeah, we just kind of go through this. <laughs> it's like, yeah. hey, man, glad to help. <laughs> <laughs> and now I assume your spook underscore Spiegel, that's a Spike Spiegel it is a Spike yep. Spiegel reference. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> we we always make the joke that uh, we were talking with Dean because he hasn't seen Cowboy Bebop, and we said we'll just do a podcast of him watching each episode, and then we'll just do like a an episode by episode thing for Cowboy Bebop for him. Nice. So. Yeah, we just um I just recently did another rewatch because my uh, my girlfriend had never seen it, and we watched through it together, and still still slaps up. super hard. It's great. It's excellent. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, Dean, Nick. Thanks for being on as always. Josh, thanks for coming Thank on this you. week. Thanks for having me, guys. This was a ton of fun. We'll uh we'll have to let you come back on at some point and we'll do like a 
actual top horror movies or something, just so this way you get oh, to yeah. stretch your legs from yeah, game exactly. talk. Exactly. Branch out a bit. I'm down. Yeah. Just let me know when. So that's it from us. Uh, for Nick and Dean, this is Tim. Have a great week. Catch us on Screen Refresh the first Monday of the month and stay spooky. <laughs>